Have a wonderful and memorable meeting. On behalf of EGESCO Board, I would like to welcome you to the third international meeting of the Egyptian Society for Continuous Ophthalmic Education. Vascular tumors of the iris. Limited or less in thickness. In management of diabetic retinopathy. Cataract surgery, those symptoms. Children, sometimes it is not simple. In which day uh, do we have to ask ourselves what? Bilateral cataract is different from bilateral cataract. Nobody. About concepts in target blood pressure lowering. So we go to the lower traffic track to be in a healthy group. Not just how is my pressure, I have been inside the eye, please take the tube away from the core. Welcome and good afternoon. It is now seven uh, past one uh, Cairo time. Uh, as we are across the continent, so I would like to say good evening and good morning to friends and colleagues all over the world. Uh, I'm Ahmed Mustafa Abdurrahman, a Professor of Ophthalmology and Glaucoma Consultant, Cairo University. And it gives me a great honor to welcome you to the webinar Glaucoma Management Across the Continent. The webinar is organized by the Egyptian Society for Continuous Ophthalmic Education and is sponsored by Pfizer. It's a great pleasure to welcome the international faculty, Dr. Cyrus Mehta, the Chief of Surgery, International and Mehta Eye Center, India, Dr. Shamira Pereira, Senior Consultant Ophthalmologist, Glaucoma Service, Singapore National Eye Center, Dr. Ahmed El Karmouti, Senior Ophthalmic Specialist, Morefields Eye Hospital, London, UK, Dr. Andrew Scott, Consultant Ophthalmic Surgeon, Glaucoma Service, Morefields Eye Hospital, London, UK, Dr. Ali Hafiz, Associate Professor, University of Montreal, and Adjunct Clinical Professor, McGill University, and Dr. Mohammed Said, Associate Professor of Clinical Ophthalmology, Bascom Palmer Eye Institute, Miami, Florida, USA. So thank you very much for being with us in this uh, webinar. Uh, now we will start the program and please, if you have questions, please uh, write down your question by clicking the Q&A button. Uh, uh, we will start by the uh, first, uh, the, the, we will start the talk by Dr. Uh, Mohammed Sayed by uh, tube surgery, when, how, and what is the evidence? Dr. Mohammed, please. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, thank you so much. I'm, I'm honored to be with you today. And uh, my talk today is going to be about tube surgery. Uh, when, how, and what's the evidence? I have no financial disclosures. So glaucoma drainage devices are being increasingly utilized in the surgical management of glaucoma. We can see that between 1994 and 2010, this is a 10 year old graph, um, there has been a steady decline in the number of trabeculectomies that had been performed in the United States. This is in part likely 
attributed to advances in medical therapy as prostaglandins had been introduced um, around the mid-1990s. But what's interesting is that during the same time period, the number of tube shunts that had been placed in the United States had, has, has been steadily growing. However, I should point out that the axes are different here as trabeculectomy continues to be a much more commonly performed operation than tube shunt surgery. And even though this is a, a 10 year old graph, I still think that this is uh, valid today. This shift in practice patterns in glaucoma surgery is pretty obvious. The traditional indications for glaucoma drainage implants um, have been failed trabeculectomy, conjunctival scarring, um, neovascular glaucoma, uveitic glaucoma, epithelial or fibrous down growth, and childhood glaucoma refractory to angle surgery, and if the patient requires a contact lens to correct a fakia that would be unstable with the overhanging blab. However, and thanks to the results of the TVT study we'll be talking about today, um, glaucoma drainage implants have been increasingly utilized as a primary glaucoma surgery by many surgeons. Um, and um, they are now the go-to procedure of choice for all glaucomas necessitating more than a um, MIGS procedure, for example, for many surgeons. Uh, but trabeculectomy for sure remains a viable option in virgin eyes and in eyes with um, normal tension glaucoma or when a target pressure in the high single digits is aimed for. So I'm going to show a video demonstrating my basic technique and here I'm implanting a Barville 250 device. So I start with a superior temporal um, 7.0 vicral traction suture um, that is uh, double armed and I leave the needles in. And um, I actually put that on a locking needle holder that I hand to my assistant. I even mark the um, sides of pyridomy, the extent, typically encompassing both the superior and lateral rectus margins. Um, and I start at the limbus, I create a small um, snip and then a relaxing radial incision. Um, I then dissect uh, very carefully um, both tenons and conjunctiva, and um, I try to hug the limbus um, for the limbus based, uh, for the for the fornix based flap. And um, yeah, I make sure that I cut all the um, fibrous or tenons bands that um, are in the way. And when I reach my end point, I create another relaxing incision. So here I'm making a bigger relaxing incision. And here I do another radial on the other side. And then I start to dissect posteriorly. And it's important to actually cut all the um, intra intermuscular septum uh, fibers and um, all the tenons fibers. And, uh, you know, then I use a, a tenotomy uh, scissor to kind of like, you know, just make sure. And then um, I hook the superior rectus and the lateral rectus uh, muscles and make sure that like, you know, they are free from any uh, scleral adhesions. And now I bring the um, implant and I tuck one of the wings. This is the 250 implant, but the 350 is very similar. I tuck one of the wings first and then the other. Um, I center it well. I make sure that um, like it's, it's actually um, a little bit posterior to the, not, not really pressing on the insertion of the muscles. I like to work in a bloodless field really. So without really like overdoing um, you know, the uh, cautery, I still make sure that uh, my field is pretty much bloodless. And then with an 8.0 nylon, um, I fix the um, implant to the sclera. And we have to make sure here that the implant is very tightly secured to the sclera. Why? Because any micro movement, if the implant is not very tightly secured, any micro movement is going to encourage fibrous tissue formation and um, hyper encapsulation. 
uh, which would limit the IOP lowering efficacy of the implant. So I just make sure that it's very tightly sutured. Um, and then I, uh, after I cut the, the 8 I rotate the knots um, and bury them in the eyelets so that they don't really puncture the conjunctiva or bother the patient. And after that, I bring a segment of 7 Vicro and I tie it tightly. These are three throws and this is a flat, um, yeah, so uh, class flat, and then I tighten it, I tighten it very securely, and I have to see that saucerization of the tube to make sure that it's actually very tight. Then I test it, I create an air column in the tube, I inject BSS with a 27 gauge cannula, just make sure that it's absolutely watertight, and then uh, put in two more throws or even more sometimes just to make sure that it's completely secure. And this is uh, supposed to dissolve in about anywhere between five and six weeks. Then I bring the, the, the globe to the primary position. I cut the tube uh, bevel away from the iris. Then with a 69 beaver blade, I create a small groove. And then I bend the needle and it should actually be obtuse angle, not really right angle. And then I mark it so that it's easier for me to find the site. And then I enter the, um, make the, the, the needle entry and, and see how it is laid flat on the sclera until the tip is actually, actually reaches the limbus and then the heel is lifted up and I enter absolutely parallel to the iris. Then I tuck the tube into the eye and I fix it uh, with a 7 um, mattress suture just to make sure that I don't have um, upward bowing of the tube. And after that, I'm going to make a fenestration or two to help with early post-operative control of the pressure. This is the half moon patch graft. Here's the fenestration. This is a split thickness cornea patch graft that I suture at two points with 7 Vicro to the sclera. And then I close. So I make sure that I do two mattress sutures at the limbus, at the uh, two corners, and then you can actually close with either interrupted, the, the radial incisions with either interrupted or running um, sutures. I'm gonna skip the rest of the procedure. So, what is the evidence? The TVT and PTVT studies, the trabeculectomy versus tube and the primary uh, trabeculectomy versus tube study. Um, the TVT was an older study. We have five years of follow-up um, and the PTVT is the newer study. And most recently, the three-year results have been published um, in uh, AJO, however, like most of the analyses that we're going to talk about today are based on the one-year PTVT results. So the per, the, there are similarities and differences between the two studies. The purpose of the two studies was to compare the safety and efficacy of tube shunt surgery and trabeculectomy with mitomycin C. The differences in the study population, really. So the TVT, it included patients with prior cataract and or uh, glaucoma, incisional glaucoma surgery, while in the PTVT patients had no incisional ocular surgery whatsoever. And patients were randomized to either a barbell 350 glaucoma drainage implant or a trabeculectomy with mitomycin C, although the dose of mitomycin C was different between the two studies, four minute exposure, 0.4 mg per ml. 
for the TVT while it was only for two minutes in the PTVT. So um, patients were seen at one day, one week, one month, three months, and up to five years postoperatively. Um, the outcome measures were failure. Failure was defined as a pressure higher than 21 millimeters of mercury or um, reduced to less than 20% of baseline or IOP that is equal to or less than five millimeters of mercury, glaucoma reoperation or no light perception vision, pressure, number of glaucoma medications, the visual acuity, the visual fields, and the surgical complications. So if we look at the demographics of both um, studies, um, the TVT study patients were about a decade older than the PTVT study. Uh, the number of males was higher in the PTVT study. Um, the, like, you know, the percentage of patients with diabetes and hypertension were um, higher in the TVT compared with the PTVT study. Now, for baseline ocular characteristics, we note that the pressure in the TVT study it was a little higher than in the, the baseline pressure than in the PTVT study. And we're gonna know why this is important in a little bit. Um, primary open angle glaucoma constituted the most common form of glaucoma in both studies. And in both studies, actually the um, severity of glaucoma was uh, quite advanced as we see from the uh, mean deviation of the Humphrey visual field. So if we look at the pressure lowering in the TVT study, we see that um, the pressure lowering was more or less um, similar between the tube and the trabeculectomy um, group, except for the initial um, um, you know, six months or so when the trabeculectomy was uh, significantly, the pressure was significantly lower in the trabeculectomy group versus the tube group but they kind of like, you know, both evened out um, at the end. While in the PTVT study, the trabeculectomy group had a lower pressure at all time points. So the, the, if we look at surgical failure, the graphs in, in this slide give us some information on the surgical, fa in the surgical failure in the two studies. Note that the scale on the vertical axis in these two figures is different. So using Kaplan-Meier survival analysis, um, the cu cumulative probability of failure was higher in the trabeculectomy group compared to the tube group throughout the five years of follow-up in the TVT study. However, in contrast, the failure rate was higher in the tube group compared with the trabeculectomy group during the first year of follow-up in the PTVT study. Risk factor analyses were performed in both studies um, to identify baseline factors that would predict failure in each study. And we note here that the randomized treatment was significantly associated with failure in both of the studies. But it was a different randomized treatment for each study. In particular, trabeculectomy was associated with failure in the TVT study, while tube shunt surgery was, was associated with failure in the PTVT study. The preoperative intraocular pressure was also significantly associated with failure in the PTVT study, but not the TVT study. And interestingly, there was a significant interaction between these two predictors of failure in the PTVT study. These figures um, illustrate the interaction between the preoperative intraocular pressure and the randomized treatment in the PTVT study. So in this, Post hoc analysis, patients were subdivided into three groups based on uh, preoperative intraocular pressure. Those with uh, pressures lower than 20, 21 millimeters of mercury, um, th there were three groups, 21 millimeters of mercury, 21 to 25, and those with baseline pressures higher than 25. And we see that the, you know, the cumulative probability of failure was significantly higher in the tube subgroup that had pressures less than 21 compared with the other um, two subgroups. Um, a similar post hoc analysis was performed in the TVT study. And we see there is also an interesting relationship here between the pre-op IOP and, and surgical failure. The higher the pre-op IOP, 
the greater the treatment benefit of tube surgery compared uh, with trabeculectomy in the TVT study. So given the influence of preoperative intraocular pressure on the relative success of trabeculectomy and tube shunt surgery, it's noteworthy that patients on average had lower levels of intraocular pressure at baseline in the PTVT compared with the TVT study. And in particular, about 40% of patients in the PTVT study had pressures less than 21 millimeters of mercury compared with only about 20% in the TVT study. And I think this difference in baseline intraocular pressure is seen between the two studies helped explain some of the differences in the treatment outcomes that were observed between the two studies. This is the data on the surgical complications. So early postoperative complications occurring within the first postoperative month occurred with a significantly greater frequency in the trabeculectomy group compared with the two group in both studies. The rate of late postoperative complications, um, if we see here, um, that occurred after a month was significantly different in, in either, was not significantly different in either study. Serious complications, on the other hand, defined as, you know, complications that required three operations and, and or produced loss of two or more lines of Snell and acuity occurred significantly more frequently in the trabeculectomy group compared with the two group in the PTVT study, but not the TVT study. Now, this was all based on the one-year um, analysis of the PTVT studies, but most recently, the uh, PTVT um, had the three-year results published, and we see that actually at three years, there is no difference in efficacy between the two, uh, between the, the, the tube and the, the trabeculectomy and the PTVT. So what, what is the take-home message here? What are, what are the clinical applications? So it, from both studies, we know that tube shunts and trabeculectomy with mitomycin C can effectively reduce pressure to the low teens, something that is not really afforded by the recent MIGs. Like, you know, none of the MIGs really lower the pressure that much. Um, the comparative success rates of tube shunts and trabeculectomy with mitomycin C are influenced by uh, prior ocular surgery and preoperative pressure. In eyes with uh, prior cataract surgery with intraocular lens and or um, glaucoma surgery, Tube shunt surgery is generally preferred over trabeculectomy with mitomycin C, especially in eyes with higher preoperative pressure. In eyes without prior incisional ocular surgery, trabeculectomy with mitomycin C may be favored over tube shunt surgery, especially in eyes with lower preoperative pressure when, or when you know, a target pressure in the single digits is desired. However, the complications are higher for trabeculectomy, we know that. Surgical complications are common. They are very common after both, but most of them are actually transient and self-limited. The safety profile of both procedures is similar in eyes with prior cataract and glaucoma surgery, but two shunts are safer uh, when it's the initial operation. However, like really the, the determining factor for many surgeons is the experience and comfort level. So um, this is really a very important consideration. Um, and we should note here that study results cannot be directly applied to dissimilar patient groups. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Muhammad. That was really uh, very interesting. Uh, Dr. Muhammad, we have uh, some questions. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Mohammed, is there any situation where you prefer the 35 over the 25 barbell tube? There has not been a single study that um, shows any value of the bigger shunt over the smaller shunt. You know, I think that the the tube the the, the shunt size is actually a valid you know factor up until a certain point. So from the AMED size, which is like 170 something millimeters, um, 
uh, square to the 250, yes, there is a difference. We see that the 250 barbells and the 250 clear pads, they lower the pressure more than the, amet, the FP7 amets. But like if you compare the barbell 250 to the barbell 350, not a single study shows um, any difference. And there was actually a 500 barbell in the past that was like taken out of the market. It's just, it has no value. In, in, in my hands, the 250 just provides excellent results. And I, I stopped putting 350s. I don't yeah. consider it a pediatric size. This is a size that you can use with, with any age group. Mohammed, why corneal patch graft? Why not clear? Um, it's for me, I think it's just the cosmesis. Um, I use Clara now that, that I do the uh, uh, small incision clear path. You have seen that uh, video, Dr. Ahmed. Um, so it's, it comes perfectly sized um, for my small incision. However, um, you know, always I get this from the patients that, hey, I have this white spot. Is this going to remain there forever? So uh, with the cornea, uh, patch graft, we don't have this issue. Also, if we need to, um, uh, if, 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 if the tube is a little close to the limbus, if the shunt is a little close to the limbus, and we need to do some laser suture lysis and the suture is underneath the patch graft, you know, you can um, laser the, um, do a suture lysis through the cornea patch graft, but not the sclera patch graft. Uh, do you put anterior chamber maintainer? during the valve implantation? I don't. And I try not, when I do a barbell, I make, a, I, I, I fast forward at that part of the video. So I make a paracentesis at the end of the procedure. And I try, if I didn't lose too much aqueous as I was making my needle entry, I try not to inject anything into the anterior chamber. And I just leave that paracentesis that I make at the end or next day, if I need to inject some viscoelastic to reform a shallow chamber, or if I need to actually um, uh, like do a tap, um, you know, it would be uh, much easier if I have a, a, a you know, a, a paracentesis. With amids, um, the FP7, I actually le I, I overfill the AC with viscoelastic. Um, yeah, and that's the main difference. Mohamed, thank you very much. We still have a lot of questions. Let us keep them uh, to the end. Now, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce uh, my friend, Dr. Cyrus Mehta from India. Uh, Cyrus will talk about deep sclerectomy, simple and safe, 20 years now. Cyrus, please. Thanks very much, uh, Emma, for having me here. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be back in Egypt. And I was there in 2000. Four, you know, and I did the Nile cruise and all, it's just wonderful. So I'm going to share my screen now. And here we are. Can you see it? And can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you uh, clearly, yes. Yeah, perfect. So let's start. So my talk, and this is my pet topic, is uh, non-penetrating deep serectomy, simple and safe 20 years now. So trabeculectomy has always been said to be the gold standard of glaucoma surgery. So did we really need another glaucoma surgery? And what was wrong with TRAP? TRAP does have its drawbacks. We used to joke, you know, when we were doing deep sclerectomy in 99 and 2000, that TRAP provides work for glaucoma surgeons because they have to fix bleb issues, cataract surgeons because it generates cataract, the retina specialist because you get some hypotony now and then, and the infection control specialist with late bleb infection, especially with the era of mitomycin C and the large overhanging blebs we used to see. The disadvantages of a trabeculectomy versus the deep serectomy are well known. It's basically all connected with having very low pressure immediately post-op, going up to choroidal effusion and hypotony maculopathy. We've all seen trap complications like this, which we don't really see anymore. So how did I start deep sclerectomy? This was unheard of in India in the late 90s. And when I was doing my residency in the 90s, we had never even heard of this surgery. After that, I had a chance to go to Germany and work with Professor Rench. And I saw him doing this procedure and using fluorescein dye to stain the outflow from the anterior chamber. And this was fascinating. And then I did a stint with Steve Bilesma in California in 2000 when he was the FDA investigator for a little implant called the AquaFlow. 
and Steve was doing a lot of Aquaflow implants at that time, sometimes uh, two implants a day, which is quite a lot for glaucoma surgery. I saw videos by Ahmed Mustafa Abdel Rehban, some wonderful surgery, Andre Marmoud and Tarek Sharavi. And so I said, I got to try this for myself when I get back to India. A short history of deep serectomy, which we all know about probably, is that deeply dissecting the paralimbal sclera, they found that you know it oozed aqueous. And the Russians made it popular in the early 90s. Fyodorov and Koslov did a lot of surgeries with their uh, wick that Koslov was using, made of collagen. It was then bought over by the Star Company and became Aquaflow. We all went through the era of Stegman, where every international conference had Robert Stegman talking about viscocanalostomy and then canaloplasty after that, and Mermoods peeling the meshwork, which increased the flow. If you see the archives of ophthalmology in January 2002, blebs, shallow chambers, bleb leaks, fat chambers, hypotony, maculopathy, is there a better way? If the problem's in the meshwork, why are we cutting a hole in the eye? So deep serectomy, to summarize, if you see the picture on the lower right side, it's basically the excision of a chunk of deep sclera, uh, removing the roof of Schlem's canal, and then you peel the meshwork, which is the second picture on the left. So I've done a tutorial video, which we'll go through. So basically, we first start with an animation, and a lot of us have seen this animation from the Aquaflow days, but many people who are attending the webinar have probably never seen this animation. So basically, it's a superficial flap, which you make at about 300 or 350 micron depth. Again, depending on how thick your sclera is to start with in the first place. And then you have to make a deep flap and you have to know certain landmarks like the scleral spur here. Can you see the pointer? Yeah. Yeah. So the, basically the scleral spur here is the main landmark of the surgery. And that's what we teach when we teach the surgery. So we have to go at about 95% depth to unroof the canal. So once you have done the surgery at 90, 95% depth, it's pretty simple. But when you're learning the surgery, you have a tendency to go superficial. And then you always wonder why the surgery isn't working. And that's because you're just not deep enough. Excise the chunk of deep sclera. And then the final step would be to peel the meshwork. What is called inner wall stripping, which Mahmood was the first guy who showed that if you do this, you greatly increase the flow because this is juxtacanalicular meshwork and you peel it off and it has a typical stiff consistency. So let's go to the first part of the video. All my deep serectomy I started doing and the hundreds of cases that we did since then are all done like this. I don't use a scleral suture anymore. I always use in cases where we don't have enough exposure. I use a single 80 vicryl as a corneal bridal suture. And then you don't need any fancy equipment. Whatever stuff you have in your cataract set, you can use that. So you do a superficial flap with whichever crescent knife you have lying around. And the only thing here is that you have to take the flap about one, one and a half millimeters into cornea. And then you start the deep flap dissection, which is the most important part. And as you come closer to Schlem's canal, you start to identify scleral spur. And you go at about 90% depth and you can see that if you see the scleral spur here, so this is the scleral spur and right ahead of that is Schlem's canal. So if you dissect at the correct depth, you will open Schlem's canal automatically and you don't have to go looking for it. The canal will come and find you. Always dissect from the center outwards and check the flow. If there's no good flow on at the time of surgery, it isn't going to mysteriously start flowing the next day. So whatever flow you have on the day of surgery is the flow you're going to have the next day. So you always check the flow, condition the meshwork a little with a sponge. If it's not enough, peel it again and then check the flow again. So that's the typical juxtacanalicular meshwork. So again, maybe we find the flow is just not good enough and people with long standing primary open angle glaucoma like these, or are 60, 65, 70 years old sometimes, they may need a second peel like this. And when you do a second peel, because the mesh works very diseased, you can automatically see how the flow increases. And now when you check it, you have a good amount of flow. This person will have 
intraocular pressure, three, four, five the next day. If the person comes with three, four, five, six the next day, you know the procedures work. If the person has 12 and 14 millimeters of mercury the next day, the procedures failed and you've gone to superficial. Excise the deep chunk of sclera and put back with one suture or as many people are doing today, you don't put back with any suture. You just put the flap back sutureless and then using that same ATO Vicryl, so there's economy as well, you just close the conjunctiva and that's the end of the procedure. A lot of the surgery we do is combined with phaco emulsification because patients want to see better. In this case, we're using a diamond knife to make the flap and the flap shape and size is different. Again, it has no bearing on the surgery. Flap little bigger, little smaller, makes no difference. Shape of the flap, immaterial. Once again, you make a nice superficial flap depending on how thick it is so that you have enough deep flap to dissect. Go from the center towards the periphery so you get a nice superficial flap. Now, when you're going to combine this with phaco emulsification, what I want you to do is that you don't open Schlem's canal. You go near the scleral spur, but you don't cut through scleral spur. Because if you do that, and then you start doing phaco emulsification, all the iris will pop out. So now you do your phaco through a separate incision. This is just a standard phaco emulsification, rexus, phaco, eye, and you're back here. Now, at the correct depth, once you open, you can open Schlem's canal immediately, and you can see that we're just ahead of scleral spur, which is the glistening band of fibers here. That's your scleral spur. In every case, dissection doesn't go this smooth, but again, it doesn't make that much difference. Once you peel the meshwork, check the flow, advance the flap if you feel that you can still go a little anterior. You have to be a little careful, otherwise you'll get a perforation. Very important to check flow. And you can see the cut ends of Schlem's canal oozing there on the two sides. Once you're sure you have good enough flow, off goes the deep flap. And once again, put the superficial flap down. Single suture or no suture if you like. And then shut the conjunctiva with the same 80 Vicryl. I find using a single 80 Vicryl suture and sometimes a single stitch to close conjunctiva, I don't have to go back, cut the suture. It just dissolves by itself and that's the end of it. Typically, the clinical cost with a case like this would be a pressure of three, four, five, six the next day. And then that would proceed to about 12, 13, 14 in a month, month and a half. Some of the cases you find pressure is climbing up faster. Even as early as one month, I will put them on the YAG laser and use my SLT lens and just blow a hole in the trabecular decimate membrane. And one small hole is enough and procedure works. Depending on IOP, I will use mitomycin C in these cases for a minute. So this is the end result. And now we go to the rest of the talk. This procedure over time evolved into canaloplasty and we used to get the DOC glocolite device in India. And so we did a whole host of cases with canaloplasty. So to learn this procedure, you had to learn deep thyrectomy first. That's tying the proline suture. And that's the end of that. So the advantages of a deep thyrectomy with cataract surgery is one day post-op, you have no anterior chamber inflammation. You have a nice form chamber and person has pretty good vision even just a week into surgery. Long-term results are very, very good with all these people on top here. Shu, Mermud, Wrench, it's not working anymore. Bilesma, Ahmed, Stegman, all have more than 30 years follow-up with surgeries doing very well. Our follow-ups are 15, 17 years, but just started the surgery about 19 years ago. Five-year survival rates, survival trabeculectomy. If you do a YAG uh, membrane puncture, and sometimes better than trap with a better safety profile. We used to study all the cases with UBM. If you look up here, you can see this 2003. So that's about two years in, and you can see an open decompression space there. And here as well, that's a trabecular decimate membrane. This is the same case followed up in 2006. That's 2006 here. And you can see there's still a decompression space there. 
Sharavi showed us that if you look at the suprachoroidal hypoechoic area, you get lower pressure, and this was true. And definitely, there's some amount of uveoscleral outflow in these patients. This was a unique case we had operated with Steve Bilesma when he visited India, and this person had really thin sclera, and that's an aquaflow implant you can see under a thin scleral flap in an aniridia case. And we thought this wouldn't work, but lo and behold, it worked just great. And this patient still visits us. We didn't use mitomycin in this case, because the sclera was really thin anyway. That's the UBM of the same aniridia pseudofake. And you can see that's a decompression space there. That was one year down the line. That's 2005 was the surgery. 2006 was the UBM. We tried and experimented with non-absorbable implants. We took a sheet of HEMA. We cut it into different shapes because that was the era of implants and every company wanted to make an implant. So we thought we'll make our own implant and see because the rest were just too expensive. But this kind of strategy didn't really work and I found that mitomycin C worked better than an implant. Many glaucoma surgeons at the time said that, well, you know, the procedures just doesn't work. I feel that maybe the dissection was just not deep enough in my experience of hundreds of cases, we have an average pressure of 15 to 19 after 10 years, mostly with mitomycin C, I have to add. We don't have any large overhanging blebs. You have a shallow or diffuse bleb and a very good safety record. I would say my tips for success in the last 20 years is use mitomycin C because in highly pigmented eyes, unlike Caucasians, if you do glaucoma surgery, without any anti-metabolite, even for a short period of time, you are doomed to failure. The procedure will just scar over after some time. Even with a, a tube shunt, as I was seeing Dr. Mohammed Syed speak about his wonderful surgery with the tube that we just saw, in Indian eyes, especially with dark skins, if you don't use mitomycin C, you'll have a big scar sitting on top of the bar welt after some time. Dissect deep enough, don't tie the flap back watertight. You can just leave it loose or have no stitch. And very important to use a YAG. If you find pressure climbing 18, 19, 20 at one month, use a YAG and don't feel scared to blow a hole. Your iris will not come out through the opening. Evolution and revolution are the markers of human history. It's not the strongest of the species that survives or the most intelligent, but the most one most responsive to change. And this is what Steve told me when I went to see a deep serectomy with him. He said, well, you know, Cyrus, everyone's doing trap, but just read this. And this is a, I think we have a minute left. And this is what I like to do uh, when I have nothing to do on, on Sundays. I take my motorcycle to the uh, superbike school. And uh, they were so shocked that you had an eye doctor coming to do this stuff, you know, because generally surgeons are paranoid about injuring the hands and having this kind of issues and the release of Top Gun is coming and Tom Cruise rides this bike in the next uh, Top Gun movie. So I thought I'll just share this with you and uh, I think this is the end of my talk. It was just wonderful being with all of you today and thanks again Emma. So that's the uh, end of my talk. Cyrus, uh, thank you very much. That's really fabulous. Um, Cyrus, uh, do you routinely perform paracentesis in deep sclerectomy? I have some questions for you. Yes. Good. And then, um, if you are putting a single suture on the scleral flap, are you yes. depending on a subconjunctival filtration or? forming a scleral lake. What's the principle of, uh, of, of how deep sclerectomy works in your mind? You know, when we started doing deep sclerectomy, everyone said that you have to suture the flap back tight. So I tried that. It didn't really work for me. So I really do think that this is more like a guarded trabeculectomy. There is some uveoscleral outflow because you are dissecting deep. But I don't think the fluid's really going back inside Schlem's canal. I think it's more like a guarded trabeculectomy so that you don't get that initial post-operative hypotony and the effect of mitomycin kicks in the effect of your YAG laser, iridotomy, uh, YAG laser puncture, gonio puncture will kick in in a month or so when it's safer to have the pressure coming down. 
So I don't really think that the flow is going back into Schlem's canal. So I certainly do think there is some subconjunctival uh, filtration for sure. But yeah, we never get like these overhanging large blebs, even with mitomycin. Yes. Uh, is there a situation where you are not going to use mitomycin or use it in all cases? So if I find it's a, a, a patient uh, where with the sclera is very thin, I won't use mitomycin. Otherwise, I use mitomycin in every case. All the cases where I didn't use mitomycin, within one or two years, all the procedures failed. So I went on to 100% mitomycin, but we put mitomycin in a very low concentration only for one minute. We don't put mitomycin for two or three minutes uh, under a high concentration. We don't get a large overhanging blebs. You get a shallow diffuse bleb. Yes, thank you very much. We have uh, lots of questions, by for, but for the interest of time, thank you very much, Cyrus. That was great. Then I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Shamira Pereira from uh, Singapore. Uh, Shamira will talk about trabecular meshwork stick. Shamira, please. Thank you very much for the uh, very kind introduction. I hope all of you are having a good day. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. And can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah perfect. Okay. I hope everyone in the audience that they're staying safe during these troubling times. But um, hopefully we're going to be out of this soon. So I think it will be, um, it'll be great to come to uh, Egypt and see you all in person. Thank you very much to yeah. Dr. Ahmed for asking me to speak more, today. Yeah, so I'm time. speaking on my pet topic, which is trabecular meshwork mix. And where do we stand right now? These are my financial disclosures. So these TM MIGs share some concepts that are all very similar. They have this promise of a better quality of life that balances out their poor cost effectiveness because they're all expensive and more, more so than any of the um, other surgeries that we do. Now they have this uh, unique concept of having uh, a very, very low risk profile. And of course, together with that is the low reward as well. The reason why I like these, and I think it's worthwhile talking about them is because they're here to stay. And I think most people like them because they're very elegant procedures. Across the world, you can see that the total market for MIGS is almost a billion dollars, estimated in 2023. And in the Asia Pacific region, this is meant to be outstripping that of the rest of the world as well. As you can see from these uh, market research studies, you can see that the, um, the growth in these stents, especially, which are especially for the uh, Sam's Canal, seem to uh, displace those of the shunts. The shunts are the ones that are moving fluid from one space to either supracoidal space or to the subconjunctival space. And you can see that this, is, this has really been a big growth area in glaucoma surgery. We think of it as this is our new renaissance, you know, the, uh, the corneal guys have had it with their lamella surgery, the retinal guys with their anti-VEGF agents, and this is our renaissance now. So this is how this has impacted my practice, and I think this might be similar to anyone who's adopting this right now. You can see that in 2009, for example, 10 years ago, I was doing mainly trabeculectomies and phacotrabeculectomies for my patients. And as you can see in 2017, whilst numbers have grown as well, despite the department also growing in size by three times, you can see that the phaco mix forms now almost about 50% of the work that I do. And as we're getting more and more complicated, we get more confident with these procedures, we're using it in more complicated cases as well, really pushing the envelope into those with more severe glaucomas and the more unusual cases as well. So whilst this is not going to be an exhaustive talk on all of the different types of Schlem's Canal and TM mix, I'll just note down some of the more commonly used and uh, uh, unique devices that go into that area. So I'll be speaking about the ABIC, Hydrus, the I-Stents, Trabectome, and the KDB. This is where they all sit in terms of uh, their positioning. And you can see that this area has really grown. And there are some that I haven't even mentioned here. Importantly, they target different amounts of Schlem's Canal. And we'll talk about that later, how important that is. So when you look at these TM mix, if I take your attention to the column on the left here, you can see that they're all quite variable in terms of difficulty of use. But um, they have some similarities in terms of there's little collateral damage, bleeding is very much more self-contained, and there's little opportunity for device malposition. 
And very importantly to us, there's no evidence of it affecting the subsequent surgery in a negative way. The efficacy, of course, is going to be less than the others in the subconjugal suprachoroidal space because you're always going to be limited by epistolar venous pressure. That's a good thing and a bad thing as well. So these types of surgery are insert it and forget it, and they, they're more targeted at the cataract surgeons in some ways. The problem with this area is that scarling or failure in this space cannot be really modified as it can with the subconjunctival devices. But the good news is at least it might be able to give your patients a drop holiday and improve the success of a subsequent trabeculectomy if you need it. And the important thing for our patients as well is the incredibly good safety profile. I think one of the key advantages of these surgeries is that um, they're fairly easy to perform, but you need to get a good view. And for those of you who are teaching it to your juniors, I think that the visualization of the angle and also the positioning of the patient are the, the key things. And you can do even difficult situations with the correct positioning of the patient. I won't go into much of that now because there's lots to speak about each of the individual devices, but you can see that uh, good preparation always pays off in the longer term. So I'm just going to go through some of the different portfolios here. So this is the one for the uh, Glaucos group, and you can see that they've initially came out with their iSent 2012, it's moved on to the iSent Inject 2018, they've got a wider um, uh, uh, one now as well, which got, got, um, uh, has more stability and it stops it moving around so much in the canal. That's the iStent SA that was launched earlier on uh, last year. There are other devices as well which they've got, uh, the iStent Supra, but we won't go into any of those at the moment. I'll just concentrate on the ones that are in the SEMS canal. So here's the original device. It's a titanium uh, device coated in heparin and it just moves and sticks into the uh, canal um, providing a bypass of the resistance Here's another one going in into the trabecular meshwork. It's, it's got grooves in it which help it stay in position and it's fairly easy to put in once you've got the, the good visualization of the patients. The problem with these devices is that um, it does have, require a learning curve as well. And of course, there's the issue about these devices moving around in the canal as well if they're not correctly placed. If you don't get it in the canal, then it isn't gonna work at all. This is what it should look like in the post-op period. The large studies of these devices showed that actually when you put in more of them, it, it led to a better IOP lowering. So when you move from one to two to three, you're getting a better uh, IOP lowering. And they settled on the two devices with the iSET Inject being the sort of comfortable ground at the moment where these devices uh, sit. And in the future, I'll just let you know that there is going to be a triple device coming out, which is called iSent Infinite, which uh, means that actually they're probably thinking that there is greater efficacy when you're targeting a larger area of Islam's canal. You're more likely to hit these collector channels, which are the highways of fluid egressing from the eye. So this is the next uh, device, the iSent Inject, and it's, it's a device which uh, pushes two collar stud iSents into the trabecular meshwork. And you've got two eye sets that go in, placed about a couple of clock hours apart, and also you get four shots at doing this. There's a nice study here that shows you the potential efficacy of these devices. I think this is an important slide to show what can be done and what can't be done. And I would generally pick my patients as those are the ones that have controlled glaucoma on two medications or uncontrolled glaucoma on one medication. Don't expect too much with these procedures. And there is limited evidence now going out to uh, five, six years with these devices. So we do have some very long-term results as well now. Here's a video of one of these going in. Again, you target the trabecular meshwork, you click, and it pushes the device in into the uh, stem's canal. If you're lucky, you can see some blood draining from that area. Again, you can move across two clock hours so that you're not targeting the same segment of the stem's canal, and you, again, push another device in. Hopefully, there'll be targeting different segments and you'll get a larger area of drainage. Okay, moving on to the Hydrus device. This is from Ivantis, and you can see the evolution from a very large device that sits in the canal to a much smaller one. Still, it's much larger than the previous device I was talking about. And the picture on the right shows you what it should look like when it sits in the canal, draining fluid. Now, this has the advantage of um, not just bypassing the canal, but also expanding it. We did an OCTA study, as you can see in the picture on the left, where the device was placed um, in one of the quadrants. And hopefully with the eye of faith, you can see that there was more flow in the area with the device in as compared to the area with the where the device was not used. Now, again, with this device, the idea is it will hopefully target more of the collector channels and get more drainage and a better IOP lowering. 
Now, these are some of my results and uh, you can use it in more uh, bizarre situations. Here's, uh, here's me using the hydrus in a uh, piece with uh, angle closure. You can see there's PAS on either side of the screen here. So I'm only targeting the one small quadrant where there is a viable trabecular meshwork. Here you can see the, the hydrus device going in and it's getting obscured on the left hand side by the area of PAS. So then I go in once it's in the right position and hopefully I'll be able to peel off the PAS with like a, a gony synecolysis procedure. Here you can see me going in with a spatula and just peeling it off, revealing the device in the canal. So it can be used in angle closure. In a few cases we've done it, but this is obviously off-label use. None of these TM MIGs are meant to be for this area. But I'll go into some more details about how I think these different MIGs can have different um, specific uses in our patient population. Of course, there's going to be some occlusion, and you can see, especially with the eye stents, you can see a large amount of excessive occlusion in these closed angle eyes. Here's the, the MIGs that started it all, the, tri the um, trabectome, and its newer version, the goniotome. And you can see that uh, this has got a long history of uh, studies now. And this, again, excises an area of the trabecular meshwork, probably about 120 degrees, allowing more fluid to egress. Problem with this device is it's expensive and bulky as well. So the natural um, evolution of this was to uh, make it smaller and more like a blade. And that's what happened with the KDB. And you can see the KDB does a similar kind of thing by excising a small amount of the canal, again, over about 120 degrees. And uh, you can see you get a histological sample of the trabecular meshwork, which you can remove. Again, you're hoping to hit the collector channels, which will allow more drainage. Problem with this, though, of course, is the worry that you can get bleeding. You see the nice canal um, excision there in that particular video. And the, uh, the, the, the device has been made in a particular way so that it works very well in terms of being able to remove a nice histological section. Here's one of the complications that you can get. This is a patient who got a big bleed after a KDB and the blood was trapped behind the lens. But fortunately, I didn't have to yag it. As you can see in the picture on the, the right, the capsule is still intact, but the blood just goes away. And this is a testament to the fact that the blood does drain away very quickly in these eyes with a uh, excised trabecular meshwork. Moving on to some of the other uh, types of surgery. Here's an Omni, where you thread a plastic catheter into the canal, inject some fluid, and then rip it out. So these are the slicing procedures that I'll go into a bit later on. And on the other side, you've got the GAT, which involves placing ab interno, a pro proline suture, through the canal, and again, ripping it out, either 180 degrees or 360 degrees. So I'll show you a, a video of this. This is from my colleague, uh, Zainab Aktas, who shows a 5 suture being placed into the canal here. And you can see that the flow is actually, it goes in quite easily and it flows around if you've got the right sizing of this. And this has become a useful procedure, especially for children in pediatric glaucoma because it's easy to access. And again, once it's done, you can be sure you've excised the canal as, and you're excising a large amount of canal as opposed to with a trabeculotomy. So this is it being ripped out. There's no blood appearing in this particular case. And I suppose some people might have worries about uh, bleeding if the patients are on anticoagulants. But this seems to be a procedure that, again, targets a very large amount of trabecular meshwork and also uh, may be more useful in this younger population. Though what does happen, though, you can see in these pictures on the, the right, you can see that there is some scarring, as you can see, with those areas of deeper pigmentation in the canal all around. And this will limit its efficacy in the longer term. And again, there aren't so many long-term results for how this device works there in that case. Here's a little bit, uh, conglomeration of the evidence of what we have at the moment on the efficacy of these devices and where they sit. As you can see, the eye stent and the canal passing and, and the trabectome uh, sit in an area which is probably better than ALT or SLT, but clearly not as good as trabeculectomy or deep scrotomy. But what you're offering is a different proposition here in terms of the safety, which is really, I mean, way better than anyone can achieve with any of the other procedures. Now, moving on to a bit more involved procedure, the ABIC. So this is ab interno calamplasty. And they, this is, came about because they worked out that when they did the external version, which you saw uh, Dr. Siros talk about um, earlier on, in some cases they couldn't transverse the whole canal, but even still, 
they were managing to get some IOP lowering without even having the suture tied off um, in the canal. Even if they couldn't pass it all the way around, they were still getting IOP lowering. So they did this from the inside. And here's a video of it being done. You make a small incision in the TM and you pass this catheter with a LED on the end of it so you know uh, where exactly it is. This is passed into the canal. And again, once it's passed, you can find out where it is by switching the lights off and you'll see the, the bleeping of the, the LED, the, the fiber optic uh, cable inside. Uh, this is a quite a tight fit sometimes and sometimes you might not go all the way around. Here's the bleeping of the LED so you know where it is. Once it's gone around 360 degrees, you hold it in place and you inject viscoelastic and pull the catheter out into the uh, into the AC. So you can see here the canal looks much bigger and you're expecting an IOP lowering uh, that should be better because the supposition is that this will at least affect the the episcleral venous pathway. So the injection of the viscoelastic, which is usually healed on GV, in particular squirts along the way, will be able to target that pathway and give you an extra IUP lowering. Results again um, are, are not for such a long period of duration, but you can see some um, unique features in that it seems to reset the trabecular meshwork. So it doesn't matter if the patient's on one, two, or three medications beforehand, it does seem to reset to the similar amounts as time goes on. So this is a bit of a complex slide just to show you um, some of the, the efficacies that you can see. But I think the jury's out as to whether if you target a more larger area of the stem's canal, are you going to get better IOP lowering? So the question should really be, is it worthwhile going to all the extra trouble of doing this? I was very fortunate in that I was able to have a lot of these devices free to me uh, during a period, a couple of years back from the pharma companies. And I wanted to find out if I could use these particular devices as targeted therapy for particular patients. So this is very much anecdotal evidence, but I was finding out that I would have a particular device, for example, a hydrus that I would think would be better for the angle closure patients. The idea that uh, the G2 probably would get clogged up very quickly. And once that happens, it's, it's not working. Uh, the GAT and the ABIC would be reserved for slightly more uh, difficult cases. Uh, and of course, this also does depend on your own uh, comfort level with these devices. The trabectum would be useful but in, in some cases, and the Kahoot dual blade as well, but I would avoid it in cases where there were large amounts of iris uh, strands where they could get caught and you might run the risk of causing DM detachment or even if you go downwards, it, causing an iridialysis. So uh, again, in terms of uh, my practice, I would like to think that in the future this area would simplify and you'd find uh, a particular device that would be more efficacious in a particular population. But for now, in terms of your own journey th towards these TM MIGs, I would suggest that you probably start off with the, the easier devices and work your way through to the others and you can stop at whatever level you feel comfortable at. So just in, in summary, these all these TM devices are expensive. And the only one that isn't at the moment is the, the GAT. It's just the price of a protein suture. And this may well be the correct procedure for the developing world. And in parts of uh, Africa and Southeast Asia, this may well be the case. It's certainly sweeping the areas of uh, Eastern Europe for sure. The skills that you learn from MIGs are transferable. So what you learn on one, you can transfer to the next one. And hopefully these will get easier and easier to perform as you get more used to the the anatomy and how to put these devices in. And I hope in the longer term future, we'll get more RCTs and comparisons because at the moment, the evidence is very much lacking for one device versus another. It's all uh, very anecdotal evidence and of course bias. So what I've learned along the way is don't use any shortcuts. I've tried them all and I think it's best to stick to the rules for these cases. So what's the future? Are we gonna have concurrent MIGs being used? Um, it depends. I mean, I think I suppose if you can have different areas being utilized, the suprachoroidal space and the TM, once they're maxed out, yes, you can move to other areas, I suppose. Will the indications expand? Will it move to OHT? If they're certainly safe enough, I suppose, but of course there's a price issue. And will we get image guidance to put these devices in the right place? Can we find the clutch channels? That's the, the big wish for the future. I think the field will naturally rationalize and we'll get lesser choice, which is probably a good thing. And of course there needs to be a a good move towards reimbursement for these models. So with that, I wish you all the best of luck with your MIGS journey. Thank you very much. Shamira, thank you very much. That's really wonderful. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh,
Yeah, actually, you have answered most of the questions uh, we received, but um, a few questions that you experience hypotony with I stand inject. Uh, none at all, because uh, if you got it into the right position, it's only going to be limited by EVP. So you're going to get um, pressures uh, are always going to be above 11 or so. What's an interesting topic to look at is how many of these TM MIGs actually achieve that EVP, that level. So that should be a good marker of efficacy across the board. I'd like to see that. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, during that procedure, if the suture is stopped, then what, what do you do? Because there is a question that sometimes we face these due to some anatomical problems with the Schlems canal. Absolutely right. So I think one thing we've definitely learned is it's not just a featureless tube. And you can always go the other direction. And wherever you can come out, I suppose you can always make an incision and just rip out as much as you can. Some people do 180 degrees. So um, there is a, a, a something that you can do for that. But of course, I think the more efficacious one is the full 360. Interesting. So, uh, Shamira, when do you do a trabeculectomy or deep sclerectomy? So that do you apply, if you have mixed, do you apply them for all cases of glaucoma or you still, do you have I, I, I think. I think I'll be able to explain the, uh, the the natural journey of a surgeon. We start off learning a device and we're very cautious. Then as we, our confidence grows, we start using it in more and more advanced situations and more difficult and ex exotic situations. Then when we've gone a bit too far, we naturally sort of uh, find our natural position by clawing back a little bit. I think I'm in that zone now. I've, I've, I've gone and done it in uh, some cases which are a little bit, let's say, exotic. And I've, I found out what it can be used and I more importantly know where it cannot be used. So I think I've left to, uh, those patients that are on two or more drops and uncontrolled, they need a trabeculectomy. It probably can't be done with uh, any of these MIGs. And I don't think you should really be expecting that for these in the longer term. Shamira, thank you very much. That's really great. So that uh, now the uh, next talk will be uh, by uh, Dr. Ali Hafiz. Uh, Dr. Ali Hafiz will uh, talk about lens surgery and angle closure glaucoma. Dr. Ali, please. And just give me one minute. I cannot find my computer in here. And it's okay. Okay. Uh, Shamira, did you uh, stop sharing, yeah? Did it? Okay. Okay, great. Yeah. Now we see the slides, Dr. Ag. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let me start by thanking you, Ahmed, and uh, and uh, saying how how much of a pleasure it is to me to uh, to be uh, within this group today. Uh, I uh, I consider Egypt uh, my my home, <laughs> not uh, not just like dear to me. It's it's where I uh, uh, grew up, and and it's at Cairo University where I got my my initial training, and and. Uh, I, I still believe I'm a son of that uh, fantastic institution. Um, so if I'm talking about uh, lens uh, surgery in, in angle closure glaucoma, I have no financial disclosures. And I'm, I'm gonna start by um, the four objectives that I, I, I think I'm gonna cover in, this, uh, in the coming few minutes, uh, knowing the cataract extraction um, help in resolving um, uh, residual angle closure uh, after uh, laser iridotomy. Uh, do we obtain a better outcome if cataract extraction is combined with goniocyniculysis? Do we obtain a better outcome again if it is combined with endocyclophotocoagulation? And finally, how about clear lens extraction 
are we there yet? So um, angle closure glaucoma is, um, is less prevalent around the world um, when we compare it to open angle glaucoma, but its contribution to visual loss is, is significant. Um, 0.6% of, of the general population has, has angle closure glaucoma and 6% of all patients with uh, glaucoma. And um, we have an increased incidence in uh, above 55 years and more in females. Uh, so which patients are at risk for that? Um, the uh, eyes at risk uh, for primary angle closure glaucoma are the smaller eyes with decreased axial length, uh, um, a large uh, uh, lens uh, with an anterior uh, displacement of the iris lens diaphragm. And this creates some kind of a, a, a narrow, uh, a small anterior chamber um, in terms of depth and a narrow uh, filtration uh, angle. Um, the mechanism is, um, in most of the cases, pupillary block. That, that uh, uh, configuration of the eye uh, predisposes to, to pupillary block and, uh, and, um, and creates the problem. But there are as well non-pupillary block mechanisms. Um, uh, plateau iris configuration can, can predispose to that. Uh, peripheral iris crowding and the anterior uh, positioning, the more anterior positioning of the lens what we um, refer to as a high lens rise. For years, for decades actually, we have been using laser peripheral iridotomy as an effective method to uh, treat uh, primary angle closure. Uh, why? Because it relieves the pupillary block, it widens the access to the filtration angle, and thus reduces the elevated intraocular pressure. Um, this is a study um, by uh, 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 a group from China, 100% um, of uh, the uh, patients presenting with an acute attack of angle closure glaucoma had a resolution of the attack after laser peripheral iridotomy. Um, but six months following uh, the uh, laser treatment, 58% developed elevated intraocular pressure and 33% needed trabeculectomies. So in another study, um, they, they, uh, they looked at narrow angles um, following laser uh, iridotomies and, and, and found that there, were, there was a, a degree of peripheral anterior synechia that could reach up to 180 uh, degrees. And it is in just these uh, patients with peripheral anterior synechia of more than 180 degrees that recurrent elevation of intraocular pressure has been uh, recorded and has been correlated with the amount of uh, the synechia. As well, um, patients with angle closure post laser iridotomies were found to have uh, on UBM a high incidence of plateau iris uh, configuration. As well, these patients post laser iridotomies uh, were found if they were exposed to a dark room prone position test, uh, if they were uh, placed in a dark room uh, in a prone position for one hour. Uh, a significant uh, uh, increase in the um, intraocular pressure uh, of more than eight millimeters of mercury. So they tested uh, or they had a positive response to that uh, provocat provocative uh, test. So in, 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 in summary of, of, of this point, um, it's actually forces acting on three anatomic levels that alter the configuration of the angle and predispose to angle closure glaucoma not just at the level of the iris uh, manifested by pupillary block, but also at the level of the ciliary body manifested by plateau iris and at the level of the lens manifested by a high lens uh, uh, vault. Elimination of pupillary block by the iridotomy uh, just eliminates one of these three factors and the, others, the other two remain in function. And this is where cataract surgery uh, steps in. Um, in a study, um, 2005 in ophthalmology, uh, a residual angle closure was uh, demonstrated after a laser peripheral iridotomy in around um, 50, uh, 58, in, in, uh, in around 38 uh, percent, resulting in poor intraocular pressure control. So these patients that had that residual angle closure um, post the iridotomy. Oops, um, were um, uh, underwent cataract surgery. 
And, and now this is what happened. Uh, if you look at the left side of the graph, and uh, this is before cataract surgery, this is after cataract surgery, uh, a significant pressure drop from 19 to uh, uh, 14. Um, and again, if we um, subjected these patients to the um, dark room prone position test, you're gonna find that um, uh, before cataract surgery, half of them tested uh, positive and the other half and the other half borderline uh, following cataract surgery, they all tested uh, negative. So, um, so cataract surgery uh, was effective in the reduction um, uh, of, of the intraocular pressure and the complete resolution of, angle, uh, of the residual angle closure. Um, another study, this time from um, the uh, Hayashi group, um, looking at the effect of cataract surgery on, um, on intraocular pressure, in glaucoma patients, found, they found that the reduced intraocular pressure and uh, the number of uh, glaucoma medications um, was was uh, was uh, was demonstrated in both uh, angle closure glaucoma as well as open angle glaucoma. So, so that 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 kind of uh, effect was not just manifest in angle closure, but also in open. Uh, angle uh, glaucoma. And, and this is when they kind of proposed cataract surgery to be the first line uh, treatment uh, for uh, cases of angle closure uh, glaucoma. Um, why is that? Because it relieves the, uh, the crowding we spoke about. Um, uh, it helps deepening of the anterior chamber, widening of the angle, improving the facility out of outflow, and surprisingly also decreases the di diurnal uh, intraocular pressure uh, variation. Okay, so can we add something to that to that kind of recipe, uh, something to the cataract surgery that would even enhance uh, the effect that we're uh, looking at? Uh, yes, goniocyniculysis would be the first thing, uh, and we would apply it to, to, to angle closure patients unresponsive to therapy uh, or showing extensive peripheral anterior synechia. And now this is the technique we always use uh, a gonio lens, um, and we start always by injecting a uh, viscoelastic into the anterior chamber uh, angle. Uh, we can use an iris repositor to, um, to pull uh, the iris uh, or to pull the synechia, or we can use, like, like I'm, I'm using here, a, a kind of a peeling uh, forceps. Um, and we basically grasp near the insertion of the iris and exert a, a, a very gentle kind of downwards uh, vertical force. So not a radial force, more like a, a downwards vertical uh, force. A radial force will uh, sometimes uh, predispose to uh, iridodialysis. So again, looking into the, um, the uh, mirror, we grab in there and pull it down, and then it, it releases uh, the uh, synechia. Okay, now um, in a study, 140 eyes uh, randomized to uh, phaco uh, goniosyniculysis as opposed to trabeculectomy. Uh, the uh, significant intraocular pressure drop uh, was noted in, in both groups and was maintained for up to 12 months. Um, again, um, here they, they looked at phaco goniosyniculysis in both um, acute angle closure and chronic angle closure. Um, they looked at the intraocular pressure, the number of meds, and the extent of peripheral anterior synechia. And they found that there is a lower success rate and a higher reformation of peripheral anterior synechia more in the chronic group. So that procedure worked better uh, in, uh, in the acute kind of uh, phase when the synechias are still fresh uh, rather than in, in, in the uh, later uh, chronic uh, group. A second uh, procedure that can be combined with cataract surgery and uh, at this time um, uh, used in, in, in maybe uh, end stage uh, angle closure glaucoma uh, when there is an element of plateau iris configuration is endocyclophotocoagulation. And with endocyclophotocoagulation, uh, again, there is Uh, and with endosoto uh, cyclophotocoagulation, again, there is a, uh, we inject viscoelastic, but more in the ciliary sulcus. Uh, we apply the, um, the uh, laser, uh, it's a diode laser. And, um, and using like a, a probe, um, 
the application uh, goes to the base of the uh, ciliary uh, processes under, under direct uh, visualization. I usually start by around 250 uh, uh, milliwatts and uh, my endpoint would be the uh, shrinkage of the ciliary uh, process. Again, a study um, looking into uh, FACO uh, ECP um, uh, compared to just uh, FACO alone uh, um, reported a 70% uh, with FACO uh, ECP as opposed to 40% with FACO alone uh, success uh, rate and the um, better IUP reduction and lower number of meds. Um, when, uh, when we want to compare uh, the um, endocyclophotocoagulation with transcleral uh, cyclophotocoagulation, uh, uh, we find that um, the difference between both uh, techniques was not statistically significant. Uh, endocyclophotocoagulation had a higher uh, significant rate of corneal decompensation, whereas the transcleral uh, photocoagulation uh, was associated with a higher rate of tises and loss of light perception. Now uh, for the last uh, question um, about clear lens extraction and uh, primary angle closure glaucoma, are we there yet? Lens, clear lens extraction um, seems like a, an, an, an interesting concept. Uh, it's fairly safe uh, with the present technology that we're using, uh, even with a shallow AC, even with a high vitreous pressure, uh, we leave the superior limbus um, and the conjunctiva intact for further uh, manipulations if needed. Um, it provides visual rehabilitation, so uh, patients um, are, are usually happy uh, and, and they get rid of their uh, significant hyperopia. So it, it, it does sound uh, interesting. But for, for many years, there, there have not been enough published evidence supporting um, the, um, uh, the efficacy of such a, a technique in chronic angle closure glaucoma until in 2016, uh, the EAGLE study was presented. The EAGLE study is a multi-centered uh, randomized controlled clinical trial, um, had 40, 400 uh, subjects uh, diagnosed with angle closure or angle closure glaucoma. And they looked at uh, three things, the quality of life, intraocular pressure, and, and incremental cost per year. Um, the the, the, in, the um, recruited patients were randomized um, uh, based on intention to treat. So we had two groups, laser aridotomy and lens extraction, and were followed up uh, for three years. And um, the, the study showed that there is evidence actually supporting the use of uh, initial clear lens extraction as a first line uh, intervention um, for, uh, for angle closure glaucoma and angle uh, closure. Um, so there was better clinical uh, uh, reported uh, uh, clinical outcomes and better patient reported outcomes. Uh, they, they had 21% uh, in the lens extraction group versus 61% in the iridotomy group um, uh, uh, that, that did need further treatment. So there was less treatment in the lens extraction uh, group and definitely better cost effectiveness. So would that be um, enough for us to kind of move uh, to clear lens extraction? Um, I think not. Um, I think we still need to look into that uh, carefully and look into that uh, closely with more um, uh, studies. Uh, the Eagle study was a very well-designed study, but um, it was a multicentric study and, um, and uh, the uh, the, the maybe six countries were Australia, uh, China, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Singapore, and, and the United uh, Kingdom. So of the, of the six uh, countries, there were four of them Asian countries where uh, there was a predominance to uh, um, smaller eyes uh, and the configuration we spoke about. Um, so uh, again, part of the, of the recruitment, part of the inclusion criteria of the study was um, patients um, uh, with intraocular pressures more than 30 millimeters of mercury. Um, 
so we do not really know if that if the findings of the study would be applicable to patients uh, having uh, le having uh, less intraocular pressure um, or to patients having a, a, more, a more advanced disease. Um, and finally, a longer term follow-up for progression is, is required in such a study um, because it's a slowly progressive uh, disease. So to conclude and back to uh, my four questions, does cataract extraction help in resolving residual angle closure? Yes, I think it can be a more effective option um, post uh, laser peripheral iridotomy. Do we obtain a better outcome if combined with goniocyanicolysis? Uh, sure, but uh, definitely in early cases, in the acute uh, presentation of the disease, better than in the chronic one. Um, is there a, a, a better outcome um, if we combine it with endocyclophotocoagulation? Again, yes, but for selected cases and take into consideration the complications. Uh, and for clear lens extraction, in the absence of, of, of cataract, uh, whether to extract a clear lens or not, I think remains open to debate. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ali. This is really very interesting. You have such a critical uh, point. So, Dr. Ali, may I ask you if you have a patient with advanced chronic angle closure glaucoma? Uh, so, do you have uh, other options than removal of the lens? Well, it depends on, 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 on what the, I mean, first of all, is it, is it just a, a, an angle closure uh, component or is it like a mixed mechanism glaucoma? But if we're talking about an angle closure glaucoma, uh, a removal of the lens might be a good option. I would uh, uh, combine it with goniosyniculysis if I did find uh, extensive uh, peripheral anterior synechia in, 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 in my examination of the angle. Um, Again, uh, it depends on uh, how advanced is it like a, a, an end stage. Yes, I would sometimes uh, propose endocyclophotocoagulation. So, so you don't add trabeculectomy to the phaco for example? Um, I mean, if, 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 I am, uh, if I'm planning for a, a combined procedure, um, so I'm taking out the cataract as well as, as doing a, a trabeculectomy, uh, I, I, it, is, it is an option for me. But if I am still, so if I'm talking about a younger patient uh, with good uh, visual potential, uh, I would, uh, and, and my plan is just for trabeculectomy, no, I would not. I do not find that trabeculectomy gives me uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in that population of patients, the, um, the, uh, the outcome I'm looking for. As in trabeculectomy, in smaller eyes, in, in, in that configuration, um, can be associated with uh, yeah. lots of uh, complications in terms of aqueous misdirection, in terms of choroidal effusions. So I reserve um, that for combined, combined cases rather than trabeculectomy uh, alone. Interesting. Uh, Dr. Ali, uh, there is an increased intraocular inflammation after ECP. So that how do you think of that? Do you inject intraocular steroids, periocular steroids, long-term therapy? Yes, I do. I mean, sometimes I, there are people who, who give intraocular steroids. I do not. Um, um, I, I, I sometimes inject a beta jet as a, a periocular uh, uh, injection. And, uh, and I'd use extensive topical therapy as well. Riley, thank you very much. This is really very, very interesting. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Andrew Scott. Uh, Andrew will discuss glaucoma treatment paradigm in my practice. Andrew. Hi. Hi, can you see me? Hi. Yeah, yeah, sure. So thank you very much for inviting me to this webinar. It's always a pleasure. So I have no financial disclosures. I think it is fair to say that it is a very exciting time to work in glaucoma. During this era, we are witnessing a vast expansion of our treatment armamentarium. The challenges we now face is that of deciding how each treatment modality may or may not fit in the treatment paradigm. The starting point in making these decisions is evidence-based medicine. 
a good glaucoma doctor should be able to critically appraise the literature in order to continually extract the best emerging evidence. A glaucoma surgeon, in my opinion, should select a treatment modality guided by the evidence and not by how trendy it may be. The clinician must then integrate clinical experience and skills with this evidence. It is important uh, to remember this, especially when presented with new and emerging treatment modalities, as is happening now. In my opinion, it is better to become a master of one or two surgical procedures rather than to try and become a jack of all trades and master of none. Last and probably most important is to be less paternalistic in our approach with patients and genuinely listen to what patients want rather than trying to steer the patient to the direction of, of treatment pathway that you may think is preferable. In this talk, I will share this process of self-directed learning and I will discuss how I believe each treatment modality fits in this paradigm. I will start with angle closure. The internationally recognized classific classification of angle closure described by Paul Foster from Moorfields in 2002 describes the natural history of angle closure rather than the symptoms. In the early stages, we have PACS, primary angle closure suspect, where on gonioscopy examination, there is a position of more than 180 degrees between the peripheral iris and the posterior trabecular meshwork. The next stage of the disease is PAC, uh, primary angle closure, with anterior segment signs of the disease, which can either be raised IOP and or peripheral anterior synechia. And finally, the natural history culminates in glaucomatous optic neuropathy. Each stage should be managed differently. And here I propose a treatment algorithm based on the best evidence. The EAGLE trial, which you've heard about before, recently published in Lancet, is a randomized control trial that compares clear lens extraction to YAG peripheral iridotomy. It is important to remember that the cohort of patients studied had primary angle closure with pressures above 30 millimeters of mercury, or had primary angle closure glaucoma. The study shows that after three years, FACO is certainly the clear winner with better quality of life, lower pressure, better control without medication, and less additional glaucoma surgery. It was also the most, the more cost-effective procedure. So how do I incorporate this high quality evidence into my practice? For the PACs, the PAC and the PACG with visually significant cataracts, it's obviously a no brainer. I offer cataract surgery. For PAC with no cataracts, but IOP above 30, or for PACG, like the, like the cohort of patients studied in the trial, I offer clear lens extraction. But what about the PAX patients who do not have visually significant cataracts? Answering this question is the ZAP trial, which is another large randomized control trial recently published in Lancet and comparing YAG PI to no PI in a large cohort of Chinese patients with PAX. Surprisingly, it found no protective effect of PI at 36 months. At 72 months, the number of patients needed to treat to prevent one case of conversion to PAC was 263 per year. And here I must say that PAC was defined as either acute angle closure or IOP elevation on two consecutive visits or PAS of more than one clock hours. Conversion to glaucoma can be extrapolated from this to a number needed to treat of over one to six over 10 years. Hence, the risk of converting from PAX to PAC was low in this six-year study. And the Lancet paper concluded that in view of the low incidence of outcomes that have no immediate threat to vision, the benefit of prophylactic PI is limited. So how do I incorporate this evidence into my practice? So I no longer perform a PI on all cases of PAX. However, there is one limitation in the ZAP trial that concerns me, and this is that they excluded patients with an IOP spike of greater than 15 millimeters of mercury post dilation, or after a 15 minute darkroom provocation test. And this form of testing is not routinely done in our clinical practice and may have excluded patients with high likelihood of achieving the primary outcome. So now I perform only, uh, I only perform a PI in patients who either have diabetes mellitus or retinal pathology, 
that would warrant frequent dilatation in the future. Patients on antidepressants, which puts them at higher risk of acute angle closure. In the contralateral eye, in patients who have, a, who have had an acute angle closure attack. In short eyes, shorter than 21 millimeters. Patients who have a family history of angle closure. And I also would add patients living in remote locations who may not be in easy reach of ophthalmic, ophthalmic care should they get an acute angle closure attack. So I just wanted to touch briefly on acute angle closure attacks. I treat these patients with drops and peripheral iridotomy, like probably most of you would, to break the block. But if after this the IOP is still not controlled, I do not rush into doing cataract surgery. This is because the cornea may still be hazy, hindering a clear view during surgery in an already difficult tie, as you know. So moreover, the eye is hot with a risk of post-operative inflammation. And there is also a risk of supracoroidal hemorrhage and decompression retinopathy. So as a temporizing measure, I do cyclodiode laser in these uncontrolled cases, which has been shown to be affected, effective in these patients. And once the eye has settled, I proceed to PACO, which I perform within a few weeks and not later than six months from the attack of acute angle closure. I will now discuss my treatment paradigm for open angle glaucoma. We all know that treatment itself may contribute to degradation of the patient's quality of life. And quality of life is fundamental to my treatment paradigm in these patients. My three aims are to keep patients off drops for as long as possible, delay invasive surgery for as long as possible, and keep patients with their driving license for as long as possible. A landmark paper recently published by Ted Gower Heath's group from Moorfields, the UK GTS, GTS, shows the astonishing result that two thirds of the placebo arm who did not receive latanoprost did not progress in two years, despite having glaucoma. This suggests that perhaps we may consider offering a period of close monitoring before con commencing treatment in patients with early visual feed loss at presentation and low risk for progression. Another landmark paper, the LIGHT trial, published recently in Lancet by Gus Gazard from Moorfields, compared selective laser trabeculoplasty to drops in treatment naive patients with ocular hypertension or OAG. And it showed that first line SLT gave drop-free disease control at stringent target IOPs in 74% of patients in three years with less surgery and at a lower cost. It also showed that SLT was safe with no sight left threatening side effects. Further paper from this trial showed that primary SLT was associated with less rapidly progressing visual field loss. And the SLT was at least as effective when repeated. Now, in my opinion, this is truly a minimally invasive intervention as it is effective without compromising safety. And the LIGHT trial has indeed shifted the paradigm in my practice, and is certainly shifting paradigms across the world. After considering a period of observation, patients in my clinic with newly diagnosed OAG or OHT are now offered primary SLT. It is important to remember that patients with OAG have an average of only nine to 13 years of life expectancy from diagnosis, Hence, a three-year or longer drop-free period might confer significant benefits to the remaining quality of life. I would consider surgery only after second SLT and after three lines of medical treatment fail to control pressure and the visual field is progressing. Whilst I try to delay invasive surgery for as long as possible, it is extremely important to keep in mind that timing for surgical intervention is critical. Once the visual field progression is confirmed, I try to intervene as early as possible in the downward curve in order to flatten it as much as possible and prevent significant visual de deterioration within a patient's lifetime. The type of surgery I choose is guided by the target IOP for the individual patient. And since most of my patients have advanced glaucoma or are fast progressors, my target IOP is low, and by low, I mean 10 to 12 millimeter of mercury. 
lower teens. To this day, only trabeculectomy can achieve such low IOP, IOPs long term. And this was confirmed by the primary TVT study and several other studies. Hence, primary trabeculectomy performed using the Morfield's safe surgery system remains my operation of choice. There are some exceptions to this, for example, in cases with increased risk of scarring, such as vitrectomized eyes, or conditions with high intraocular VEGF levels, such as diabetic retinopathy and CRVO, and when cataract surgery is planned in the, in the near future of that patient. Another exception is when there is a high risk of hypotony, such as in pathological myopia, or severe posterior uveitic glaucoma, such as BKH and GIA with a sick ciliary body. When a trabeculectomy fails, when or if a trabeculectomy fails, I perform bleb needling. I usually do this uh, in the operating theater and I want to give it the best chances of success with better access, as well as the possibility to inject mitomycin C subconjunctively and the Vastin intracamerally. For patients where one or two needlings have failed, I move on to the tube to tube surgery which has been shown to be an appropriate surgical option in patients who have undergone unsuccessful filtering surgery. My choice of implants is the bare belt tube, which has been shown to produce greater IOP reduction and lower rate of glaucoma reoperation than the Ahmed valve implantation. If later on patients require further IOP reduction, I would opt for cyclodiode laser. And if this is still not enough, I would implant a second bare belt tube in the supranasal quadrant, making sure that the tube and graft are well covered by the upper lid to prevent future erosion. So what about con subconjunctival MIGs? I must admit that I struggle to find a place in my treatment paradigm for these expensive devices, which usually fail to achieve IOPs in low teens for a long enough time. Moreover, they do not offer the possibility of titrating the post-op IOP to the desired level, as the trabeculectomy does. I would, however, be prepared to accept this trade-off in return for increased safety. However, the Zen microchant requires lots of post-op manipulation, which makes post-op management very demanding. Presser flow, on the other hand, has the advantage of less manipulation, but the surgery violates conjunctiva, which can pre prejudice success of a trabeculectomy if needed in the future. I therefore reserve them for specific cases when a quick fix is required, such as in cases of hypertensive uveitis that present as an emergency and would, would need to be squeezed in into an already full theater list, or when a quick operation is required, such as in patients with dementia, where you want to reduce operating time as much as possible. There are two types of non-bleb MIGs that in my view hold some promise in glaucoma treatment par paradigms. The first is ab internal GAT, seen on the left side of the slide. This procedure, which you, we've heard about in this, in this session, uh, does not violate the conjunctiva. And in my opinion, may buy you some years before escalating to more invasive, but more effective trabeculectomy if needed. However, we still need convincing evidence on long-term outcomes. The second non-bleb MIGS that may hold some profit promise, in my opinion, is the Miniject, which you can see on the right side of the slide. This device is not yet available for sale. In the recent past, SIPAS was exciting as, I, as it targeted the supracoroidal space, thereby, thereby sparing conjunctiva and not compromising subsequent bleb surgery success. Moreover, it could be easily combined with take -home. However, it failed to deliver due to the fibrosis and damage to the endothelium. Miniject may be promising because inject or mini inject may be promising due to its material, which is soft and flexible and allegedly safer to the endothelium and microporous, which alleged, allegedly reduces uh, fibros uh, uh, damage, fibrosis. Sorry. I would like to, to touch on cataract surgery and its, its place in my treatment algorithm. We all know that cataract surgery provides a modest IOP reduction. Moreover, it can be combined with sclem, sclem canal devices such as hydrus, which can further lower IOP by around 1.7 millimeters of mercury, and ice tent by around one millimeter of mercury. Also, we all know that cataract surgery can be detrimental to trabeculectomy function. This paper from Jonathan Crowston shows that cataract surgery performed six months or more before trabeculectomy was better 
than performing cataract surgery after trabeculectomy. Hence, in my practice, I try to perform cataract surgery as early on in the patient's journey as possible, not only to achieve an IOP lowering effect and possibly combined with slam canal mix, but also so as not to compromise success of trabeculectomies if needed later on. Finally, the post-COVID era, with its social distancing restrictions, will certainly transform the way we work and shift paradigms. Some experts believe that Preservlo and the Paul tube require less post-op visits and hence may become the surgical procedures of choice. However, I believe that in the interest of patient care, treatment paradigms should not change. What should change, however, is the way we work. We should be shifting more low-risk patients to the telemedicine domain so as to reserve the precious hospital visits to those high-risk patients who need them most. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, Andrew, thank you very much. Uh, that was really a nice memory. Thank you. Uh, so, Andrew, uh, do you think the micropulse can replace the diopsis cyclophotocoagulation for uncontrolled acute angle closure glaucoma? Uh, uh, first of all, I must declare that I don't have experience with the micropulse, so I've, it's not the right question to ask me. But I think the point that I wanted to make here is, it was even asked in one of the question and answers uh, session, if you have a case of acute angle closure attack, where you, know, you obviously throw, in, throw all the drops, the pilocarpin, you want to break the block, and, 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 if, and then if that fails, and do a PI as well to break the pupil block, if that fails, you don't rush in to do any glaucoma surgery. That fails, meaning the pressure is still about 40. You don't rush in to do any, any glaucoma surgery, definitely not a trabeculectomy, and uh, I wouldn't even do a cataract operation in these situations. Uh, and the reason is because it is a very hot eye, okay? It is very inflamed, so you have risk of fibri fibri fib fibrin deposition and doing acute uveitis after. You can get supracoroidal hemorrhages, which are catastrophic to patients. You know, the cornea still, is still very edematous and hazy because the pressure is still very high. So I think we have an option here of doing the, 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 the diode laser, or maybe the micropulse as well, where, uh, you can lower the pressure, calm the eye down, and then a few weeks, hopefully the pressure will settle and it will do, and more, in my experience, they always do. And when the eye is calm, then you plan the next step. And the next step, in my opinion, should always be a cataract operation, plus or minus syniculysis. I don't do, personally, syniculysis. I never found, found it to be effective in my hands. And later on, if that's still not possible, I move on to do a tube. I, I, and then uh, diode cycle of photocoagulation is going to terminate the attract of angle closure glaucoma? Uh, it's obviously, but, it reduces, first of all, it helps as well in some, in rotate, helping to rotate the ciliary body. Yeah. There's always an element of mixed mechanism here. Okay, you can have as well uh, things pushing, the ciliary body pushing, pushing forward, but also it reduces in a, it results in a reduction in, 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 in aqueous production. And as I said, there are, there are, there are publications now showing that it, just a few case reports, uh, case series that show that it is effective. Uh, Andrew, thank you very much. That's really great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you so much, um, Andrew. Right now, uh, we're going to go to Professor Dr. Ahmed Abdurrahman. He's a professor of ophthalmology and consultant in glaucoma surgery at Cairo University. Um, he's the uh, director of the Giza Eye Center and Glaucoma Learning Center and the founder and president of the Egyptian Society of Continuing Ophthalmic Education. He has played a major role in uh, educating the younger generations of ophthalmologists in Egypt and the region, particularly in the areas of glaucoma management and surgery. Uh, he's the recipient of uh, an educational award from the American Academy of Ophthalmology as well. He'll be talking today about uh, primary open angle glaucoma in the young age. Dr. Ahmed, please. Ahmed, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful introduction. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I will uh, try to summarize the uh, topic of primary angle closure glaucoma at the young age because I see a lot uh, of those patients actually. I don't know what's the situation across continents. Um, juvenile open angle glaucoma is glaucomatous optic neuropathy before the age of 40. Um, in some reports, it's between 3 and 40, or between 5 and 40, and sometimes the upper limit is 35. 
uh, some differences in the definition, but it's generally open angle glaucoma below the age of 40. And then if we just uh, try to identify uh, certain terminologies, um, uh, during the first month of life, it's called the neonatal uh, PCG. And then up to the second year, it's called the infantile PCG. And then from the second and third year, still we can get late onset PCG. And then from the third year on till the fourth year, this is the area of the juvenile open angle glaucoma. Another interesting classification could help in better understanding of the management options and pathogenesis that that period between three years and 40 could be further divided into two zones. The first is early juvenile glaucoma from three till puberty, and then from puberty till 40. This is called the primary juvenile glaucoma. And I think that differentiation is important for the management. Then there is an interesting uh, study trying to get more into the primary open angle glaucoma that it's not a single disease getting into many subtypes and uh, Pascal has identified the type of glaucoma that develops early in life at an open angle glaucoma and called it the African dry type of primary open angle glaucoma. It starts early in life. It's a severe disease with a strong family history. So that it, this matches actually the primary juvenile uh, open angle glaucoma that developed before the age of 40. So when it comes to the genetics, it's actually autosomal dominant uh, pattern with high penetrance, and the myocellin gene uh, has been found to be mutated in uh, up to 36% of the affected individuals. And actually the gene for the um, pediatric glaucoma also, which is the CYP1B1 gene has been found in some cases. And regarding the histopathology, this is important for the management. And actually, patients with a myocellin positive, they found some extracellular deposits and the plate materials in the region of the trabecular meshwork and adjacent to the Schlem's canal, making the flow of the equus outside of the eye is not easy. That's why the pressure is elevated. Now, the risk factors for juvenile open angle glaucoma include the male gender, axial myopia, and severe elevation of the intraocular pressure because some of those uh, patients present with elevated pressure, still no evidence of glaucoma, but they will become glaucomatous. The African ancestry, post family history, myocellin mutations, and the prominent iris processes on cuneoscopy. Regarding the clinical picture, usually it's asymptomatic like the primary open angle glaucoma, but sometimes the patient, they complain of blurring of vision, especially in advanced disease and due to the corneal edema, ocular pain due to the elevation of the pressure, visual loss in advanced cases. The pressure is terribly high, usually 40 to 50 in those patients. That's the majority of the clinical picture. And we be aware of the teenagers with ocular hypertension because they need to follow them uh, actually for the development of such a disease. And the clinical picture is like that. It's a usually an open angle, but sometimes there is high iris insertion or prominent iris processes. And usually the patients present with advanced disease. And actually we have conducted some studies on the OCT and geography on those patients. And we come up with findings like the adult where there is a reduction of the capillaries around the optic nerve, the density, capillary uh, density, and the blood flow in the peripapillary area is really reduced. The average is from 50 to 60, so here it's reduced. And even much more reduction, as we can see here, it is just 37%, and the superior half, 43%. And you can see the patient up is 23 years. So that is still, you can find areas of ischemia, and then you can find even some asymmetry when one eye is more affected than the other. And the question will remain open here. Is ischemia the cause of glaucoma or the glaucoma of ischemia is the cause of ischemia? Still unresolved, unsolved question completely. The differential diagnosis is critical in those patients because for the late onset congenital glaucoma, you can have patients with glaucoma at the age of five, six, and seven, and then could be confusing with the late onset congenital glaucoma, but generally those patients do not have have to try or corneal enlargement. The second reforms of glaucoma are critically to consider the steroid induced glaucoma, so the history is important. The uveated glaucoma or the finding of KPs on the back of the cornea, generally the patients with secondary glaucoma tend to present unilaterally. 
Pigmentary glaucoma is also important and will be detected on gonioscopy. The history of ocular trauma is important. Nanothermic and microthermic actually they present with secondary angle closure glaucoma, but we just need to keep them into mind because that's the age of presentation, which is around the age of puberty. For the treatment, and actually it could be medical, laser, uh, or a surgery, uh, just putting into consideration that those patients are expected to have long life expectancy. That's why we opt for a low target intraocular pressure. Medical treatment is usually like a bridge and a transient until we get definitive treatment. Uh, anyhow, some patients might continue on uh, prostaglandins and beta blockers, but then actually the majority will need surgery in 83% of the cases. Uh, laser trabeculoplasty has a limited value because those patients usually present with marked elevation of the intraocular pressure. So SLT could help patients with pressure that's slightly elevated. Still, there is a place, but it's a limited place. Now, when it comes to surgery, we have to think and we take time in thinking, what are we going to do? Because those patients are expected to live long. So we need to think of the primary surgery and then how to solve the recurrence because of the longer life that's expected for those patients. Now for the decision making, actually there are certain points we need to think before putting the most appropriate procedure. The point here that there is no meta-analysis for most of the procedures applied on the young, those juvenile open angle glaucoma, and also the algorithm is not very clear for those patients. So you have to put some consideration, like the age of the patient, that's why the differentiation into children and teenagers so that, that that belongs to basically to the childhood glaucoma or it could be young adults from puberty till the age of 40 so then and that differentiation is really important then the severity of the disease is it mild to moderate and usually put in one basket or it's severe so that you have to also think about that the level of the pre-operative uh, pre intraocular pressure because Every operation is expected to lower the pressure with a certain number, a certain percentage, and certain number of IOP reduction as well. So you need to keep this into consideration. Previous surgery, the condition of the conjunctiva, and also very important as long as there is no clear algorithm, the surgeon's experience does play a good role in the decision making and definitely the available resources. These are the operations that have been suggested for the management of those patients. Could be angle-based surgery, whether goniotomy or ab external trabeculotomy, or what's more attractive nowadays that the circumferential trabeculotomy. And when it comes to circumferential trabeculotomy, there are more than one way to perform that uh, circumferential angle surgery, including the catheter, the eye science catheter, or the aproline suture, or two trabeculotomy incisions, or the GAT procedure, which you just have mentioned uh, in the previous talk. Non-penetrating glaucoma surgery, because uh, juvenile open angle glaucoma is a variant of open angle glaucoma that develops early. Glaucoma drainage implants and is a primary or recurrent. And then for trabeculectomy and filtering surgery, I think for the long-term follow-up, that option is really not preferred. If you can avoid it, that would be great in those patients. So when it comes to circumferential angle surgery, you can, when you look at that slide, this is one of the histopathology, you can find this is the Schlems canal and connected to the collective channels, so that if you can open the Schlems canal uh, on the anterior chamber, then you can give access to the uh, exit for the equius. And there are some reports regarding the use of circumferential surgery in patients with uh, juvenile glaucoma. Let us think of that. That's the uh, eye, eye catheter, eye science catheter. The problem is it is not available all the time. And then you cut uh, down to the Schlems canal and then you push that illuminated catheter for the entire circumference. And actually being illuminated helps in getting the right direction because sometimes you can go in an unseen direction. But here it's interesting that you push it until you get it through the other end of the Schlems canal. And then at that time, you, you will uh, you will get both ends, and in a cross fashion, you will create a, a 360 cut of the trabecular meshwork. And you can get some blood from the trabecular meshwork. And now, by applying traction, 
you will see the, the catheter is coming out through the trabecular meshwork. This is a more economic surgery, which is um, like um, putting a proline suture inside Schlem scanner circumferentially. Again, a small scleral flap, then a second flap like of a deep sclerectomy because this helps me in better identification of Schlem canal. And then this is just the trabecular bone, making sure I am in the correct uh, uh, place. And then uh, using the five upper proline suture and then threading it. Uh, and it's uh, definitely, it's, uh, this is the, uh, I'm showing you the best because it's not easy all the time. And you can uh, see with the angle that the suture is uh, running circumferentially in the canal. And then uh, you will retrieve the other end once uh, you get it through the other cut of the Schlem's canal. Uh, and definitely this is an easy, uh, an, a cost-effective surgery. And then applying gentle traction, again, gentle traction, sometimes you can find a kind of resistance until the suture will break through the inner wall of the trabecular meshwork. And uh, in the majority of patients, when you open the Schlem's canal, it's expected to get some blood this is not bad at all, and it stops after just injecting air into the anterior chamber. And some people uh, would love to see this hysema. It indicates that it was in the correct uh, plane. And then uh, this is the, uh, the other surgery, which is the GAT. Uh, and Shamir have shown a nice uh, GAT procedure where we just cut, uh, and then we get the proline, or we get the catheter, and we try to work uh, having the, the suture in the whole in, entire circumference, and sometimes not the entire circumference, 180 or the part that you can do. Now, other options, including the deep sclerectomy, because some of those patients, they come and they are 30 and 35, they are very near to the 40, so that I like to do them a deep sclerectomy, especially if they are having advanced disease, as we see them in the majority of situation having advanced disease. And this is a suture lift surgery. I apply anti-metabolites like Cyrus in all the patients, and then I just apply a diathermy at the edges of the conjunctiva. This is another modification which uh, I use, that after I expose the trabecular desmus membrane, I insert a proline suture of 10 millimeter inside both ends of the Schlem's canal. The idea here is to give some space and some dilatation of the Schlem's canal, and it will help definitely in the post-operative period where I can see the suture if I want to do a kind of um, gonio puncture. But definitely when I go for deep sclerectomy, the patient should be able to sit on the slit lamp. It's applied for patients who are young adults. This is another company, combination where the patient is just um, underwent deep sclerectomy, and then we can go for a trabeculotomy as well, so that we can combine deep sclerectomy with trabeculotomy. The point that there are so many reports in the literature describing many approaches. Then we need to think if the pressure goes up, how are we going to manage? Uh, those are some of the management options where we go for needling after deep sclerectomy, or uh, we can go for uh, uh, revision uh, if it is needed. Definitely, there is a place for implants, whether as primary procedure or for recurrent patients. And then uh, this is one of the implants available in the Egyptian market. Now, coming to the options, and actually, this is my own algorithm because there is no clear algorithm for those patients. I will put some considerations as the age, the severity of the disease, and previous surgery. Then I will go for angle surgery, peripheral circumferential angle surgery, if the patient is in the childhood period, so that if the patient, because there are good reports about the procedure in those age groups, so that tell puberty, I will opt for those types of operations. Afterwards, I will go for you know, a deep sclerectomy because it gives uh, good results in my hands. And I can add something, I can add a trabeculotomy, and definitely I add anti-metabolite. And there is a place for drainage implants, especially in patients uh, who uh, get failure of the uh, deep sclerectomy. So in conclusion, uh, glaucoma before the age of 40 has different terminologies and the gray zones. So it could be early juvenile glaucoma, from three years to puberty or primary open angle glaucoma, which is matching the African drive type of open angle glaucoma with different uh, pathogenesis and different outcomes and different surgical approaches, but they are under one umbrella of the juvenile open angle glaucoma. It's a severe bilateral disease and they often present late. A low target pressure is needed, uh, a strong genetic basis. We need to check the kids as well. 
surgical management is often required, and conflicting con uh, conclusions with trabeculectomy. And I think the trabeculectomy now is uh, try most of the uh, surgeons are trying to avoid trabeculectomy because it's, it's a very, very long um, uh, story, and the patient needs to be followed up for quite long years. And then um, a strong psychological support is really needed for those patients. They are young, highly productive, and they need a lot of the psychological support. And those are some of the references which I found really helpful for dealing with patients with um, juvenile open angle glaucoma. And with that, I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed. This was <laughs> I don't know who puts this back in front of it. Anyway, so um, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, so what's your regimen, um, the, the, the anti-inflammatory regimen after circumferential um, canal surgery in children or like in young age? I'm asking this question because there's recent evidence that like, you know, patients um, in that age group do better uh, with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory than with the steroids after um, circumferential canal surgery because um, of possible, uh, you know, distal obstruction beyond the trabecular meshwork that is steroid-induced maybe in the collector channels. It's really very interesting. The point that, that the whole approach is new to me, Mohammed, that, uh, that is not my standard procedure. My standard procedure was uh, deep sclerectomy. Uh, or uh, deep sclerectomy with trabeculotomy, but I'm now shifting to uh, a circumferential angle surgery to explore this area, especially in patients with the disease that is not severe. Uh, and the time being, I'm using actually uh, the treatment that I apply regularly for patients with glaucoma until the eye gets completely quietened. Uh, but uh, uh, but really, uh, I'm not using a, a special re regimen for those patients. But I came across something interesting which really attracted my mind that there are some recommendations that you might use myotics just to get try to get the iris away from the uh, trabecular meshwork because you can have recurrence of peripheral angiocyanite in this area. But uh, again, uh, so far I'm using the standard uh, treatment. Thank you so much. All right. So I think, uh, yeah, but one of the questions actually was uh, about TRAB in uh, juvenile uh, angle glaucoma. Uh, what, what is the proportion of your like TRAB versus like, you know, the other things, non-penetrating or circumferential angle surgery? You know, the, uh, Muhammad, I'm not, uh, at a, you know, that uh, I'm, I often don't do trap nowadays. I stopped doing trap uh, since, uh, I don't know, in, like 10 years ago, I don't do trap. This is not against trap, but uh, I feel much better when doing uh, deep scrutiny and working on this. And I like, you know, the principle of Andrew when he said that it's better not just to focus on one thing, one or two things, rather than to try to master everything uh, definitely, I know that a lot of friends can get better results of TRAP uh, than me, but definitely, I'm not the guy for TRAP. Thank you okay. so much, Dr. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you. So uh, now, uh, the last but not the least, really, uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed El Karmouti, uh, Dr. Ahmed Karmouti from uh, Morfield, and uh, Ahmed will address an interesting topic, which is hypotony which is really as serious as glaucoma, sometimes severe, uh, more serious than uh, glaucoma. Uh, hypotony like no other. Uh, uh, Ahmed, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed Mustafa, for putting this uh, excellent webinar. Actually, I enjoyed all the talks and I learned a lot today. And I would like uh, wish everyone to stay safe in this uh, interesting time. So I'm going to talk about hypotony because usually hypotony is not um, approached or uh, touched down uh, on most of the topics. Plus, it's a nightmare for most of the surgeon and really affects their um, right decision to be taken in the right time. So hypotony uh, is usually defined as intraocular pressure 
of five millimeter mercury or less, adjusted according to uh, cornea thickness. But actually, I think it should be, uh, is usually, but actually, I think it should be physiological definition. So four, and they don't have any complication, and you have, and they have hypotony and maculopathy. So I think it all put in context with complication that could happen. As I said, 40 uh, better than four, and this um, is the main, uh, main worry because you can easily lose the eye very quickly. Um, pathogenesis, so hypotony can affect actually uh, the blood aqueous barrier causing the um, uh, inflammation or cells and flare to uh, shed in, to be shed into the AC and inflammation itself can cause uh, more and more hypotony. This is important because we need to keep the steroids on. I'm saying this because some surgeons or uh, some doctors, once they see hypotony, they just stop the steroids altogether. You can cut it down, but I think you should be uh, keeping it on board. Again, choroidal fluid diffusion uh, accumulates in its potential space because there is a low pressure that can maintain this space. The most dangerous one is the choroidal diffusion uh, progress to the anterior uh, part of the eye and cause severe body detachment. This is really sometimes difficult to deal with. So the signs are go through very quickly because we know it all. Pressure is low, uh, shallow or flat EC, collium edema. But I think we should be worried about the Bowman's fold as well, because this is the only sign that can be there and can tell you that the eye cannot take the low pressure. Uh, you have to be uh, put it in context with other um, things like wound leak from the bleb. Um, corneal astigmatism will be high, cyanica formation because of ID to corneal contact. Some surgeons are surprised by cataract development. It is very high uh, in hypotony. It can progress very, very quickly. Hypotony maculopathy is more into uh, high myopes and as well some vascular engorgement and the fundus. Um, we have to correlate this as well with the large blood. This is important when I come to the large, last case of hypotony. Uh, large blab from the trap or large drainage from the shunt. Uh, if the patient had high, um, biometry before the operation, before the hypotony, you have to repeat it because sometimes it can cause an induced axial nap. Even with a successful trabi, the biometry can change. Um, as I said, some cells are flared in the AC and uh, silicoroidal detachment, and it's very serious if they are, especially if they are kissing choroidals. So I'll go through the, uh, some of the post glaucoma surgery uh, causes of hypotony. So in Trabi, I'll just touch down on the wound leak and overfiltration. Uh, for the shunt, I will uh, talk about as well over drainage and the AC and treatment. So for the Trabi wound leak, it's usually early better to have early wound leak rather than late. Early wound leak are usually self-limiting can be managed conservatively and can respond quickly to like contact lens, um, either regular or large one. But if we are talking about this one, for example, this is, I will, I'll put some few videos from Keith Barton. He is uh, my mentor and good friend as well. So with this leak, which probably developed a bit later, not that early, it won't sort itself out. It won't sort itself with the bandage contact lens. If it was early week or so, you can, but not later. So you have to go back and fix it. So you can excise it. And in this video, I'm showing you um, a technique from Mr. Uh, Dr. Norbert Pfeiffer from Germany, who I spent three months with. He, in this case, he just do a corneal um, uh, tunnel, and then he does interlocking suture. If you look at this suture, it will just pass under the, uh, the first loop and he will go on from one side to the other. He tried to use this in every case of his trabeculectomy because he's worried about the leak. But I personally would uh, save this technique to only if I had recurrent um, leak. Again, uh, another cause of low pressure in uh, after trabi is the over-filtering breath. 
And again, as I said, if it was just in the first week or two, it can be self-limiting or after taking out the releasable or uh, leasing the stitch. But if it is late, that's the one that you should probably take back the data. So in the beginning, you can just observe, add cycloplegic, or maybe reform the AC with, anti with uh, some visco. So one of the mistakes of the surgeon is that the worry of hypotony make them make wrong decisions. So this is the last releasable of three releasable were put. The surgeon thought that maybe taking the two side releasable will protect the eye against hypotony and leave the middle releasable uh, to the end. The problem is that you will not have a flow when you take the nasal or temporal releasable. But when you do the middle one, you will have a good flow with no support of the side sutures. So please, the middle releasable, if you are doing three, is the last one to be put and the first one to be taken out. So if it is chronic and that you start to have some iridoponeal contact and you want to buy some time, you can inject the provis. You can do it in clinic or you can do it in theater. I usually do it in clinic, and most of us in Morphids, we do it in clinic under covidine iodine and anesthetic. So the provisc we can inject um, on the slit lamp. Here is another one showing it. The most important thing is just you have to prepare uh, the patient. You have to warn them there will be a bit of um, just stingy pain with the entry of the needle, but please don't jump and give me a second to take the needle out of your eye. Um, if it, this didn't work for the first few um, days or week, then probably uh, you will have to go into more invasive stuff like there has been tried blood patch, laser application, cryo, this all didn't work. Sometimes, um, pseudophagic, you can inject uh, some expandable gases, but this is only left for very late overdraining blood. Again, that if taking our patient, to, uh, the patient back to theater, uh, exploring the operation and fixing the problem rather than wishful thinking is the mainstay of intervention. So this is the case of early um, revision. There was um, early hypotony, I would say um, within uh, several weeks, and the, the eye didn't settle down. If you can see here the flap, because it is early, you can still get the edges of the flap and you can put extra stitch three, four, five as you, as you want. But if this was long years after the initial operation, like a year or two, and the start, the pressure start to come down, you won't be able to find these edges. That's one. Second, if you put a stitch, it will probably cheese wire. So sometimes it's better to be prepared that you will need a patch and the half um, half an hour operation may take longer than an hour. The other one, which is the diode. Uh, usually diode have a good reputation of being safe and quick and non-invasive. But you have to be careful because sometimes you can use a diode in a viotic patient, but not in that severe sick eye patient like GIA, VKH, or VESP. But if it is non-specific anterior uveitis or infectious uveitis, you can try the diode laser. And if it's not diode, then you can have the uh, iridex or the um, low-dose diode. If it went hypotenuse, you can always use uh, injection of steroids or oral steroids to put it up. But if you lost it completely, there is nothing much you can, can be done. With the shunt implant, as Dr. Mohammed said, is now the world is doing more and more shunts. Ahmed valve sounds very uh, more, more uh, safer because it has a valve. But sometimes there are two things. Either there is a manufacturing problem and you can have the tube over draining on the table, or it's atrogenic. So the surgeon are not allowed to touch this uh, box in the valve. So, so I would show a video how to put the valve, but sometimes because you need to put the valve really back to avoid the big high capsule that can be seen very anterior, you can sometimes press on the box inadvertently and cause the crush of the valve. So this is the video. The way we hold the valve, it should be behind the box 
And when you reach the proper place and you want to push it, you have to push it from the junction between the plate and the tube, but not from the box. For the non-valve um, tube or shunts, um, I think they need a stent or a ligation. And the problem happens um, sometimes after the ligation give way or lasered, or sometimes after taking out the stent. Sometimes, or most of the times, it is self-limiting, a pressure of three, four for a week, and then start to build up again. Again, we can try some injection of the uh, Provisc, or we can add some uh, atrophy. But if it is need to be tackled, so if you put a laser, if you put a ligation stitch, and you probably need to put it back, you have to go back, pass the ligation suture around the tube again, and close it. The only thing I would like to mention that any manipulation near the plate back or the, or the tube, you probably better to make sure that you close the thinner and the conge in two layers. So it's not just one uh, uh, needle passing through the conge and thinner. No, you have to make sure that you have good thinner closure under the conge to avoid uh, exposure. If the hypotony happened after taking out the stand, so it's better to open back on the plate and inject the supramid back um, at the back of the plate. I usually don't like to open on the plate itself. I would rather um, dissect the whole conge until I reach the plate, then open the capsule, then feed the supramid, but not to open on the plate itself, just to avoid um, exposure of the plate later on. Sometimes if you don't want to open the, uh, the back or the plate because of dissected or uh, scarred down conge, you can go through the AC ab internum. And then one of the things here, as I mentioned before, which is corneal decompensation from the hypotony, you can go through in and it's, it's sometimes a sutureless uh, procedure as well. You don't have to put a stitch because it's just like a proper wound uh, performed. This is a case of a failed graft after the hypotony. And if you can't do it through the AC because of the bad um, view, you can have a corneal section, flip the tube out if there is a good length. If not, then you have to cut it and feed it inside uh, the tube while it is in situ. Makes as we uh, beautifully heard from uh, Dr. Uh, Shamira that it's usually safe and have very good reputation. It has been uh, reported by Dr. Osman from Saudi Arabia that there was uh, some hypotony after the um, trabecutome and it uh, turned out to be just a cleft. The Zen and the micro and the preserve flow, they have shown some hypotony, but this is very early and it usually it sorts itself out. And if it needs, sometimes just need um, injection of probisc in the first um, early period. So supracorridor hemorrhage, that's when things, when worse comes to worse and with this our nightmare, I think we probably have to be careful because we, if we try to send this to a VR surgeon, they have very low threshold to do vitrectomy and silicon oil injection, which probably doesn't have any um, role here because the space is the potential space of the choroid. It is not in the vitreous. So I don't think there's any role of um, vitrectomy and silicon oil in these cases. So um, basically like any, uh, drainage of choroidal hemorrhage or kissing choroidal effusion. Uh, so AC maintainer in the AC, then you bring the eye upwards because you aim for the inferior quadrants to avoid uh, for the gravity just for uh, um, drainage of the blood or the effusion inferiorly. You go um, partial thickness until you find um, a good egress of fluid if it is effusion or blood if it is hemorrhage then you leave it no suture then you close the conch and that's it the main tip i would like to say is just please try to take your time if you couldn't find any flow try to wait lift the bottle and try to press hard to find a fluid because it can take some time so this is a case of unusual hypotony for those 
um, doctors who operate on significant uh, amount or number of patients from Africa, Caribbean, and sometimes Asian as well. So this is a patient presented in 2000, early 2018 with uncontrolled pressure, um, average um, myopia or simple myopia, it's not that high, average cornea thickness, uh, diagnosed as pigmentary glaucoma, went uh, for uh, drops tried, drops first, didn't work, then offered surgery, had the operation, the trabeculectomy, late <clears throat> 2018, pressure stayed mid-teens until she developed cataract um, in the right eye, and early this year, she had the FACO and 5FU, and um, um, when she had the FACO, it went uneventful, and um, then um, the pressure went fine, like 16 or mid-teens. Later, um, she had, in May, she presented with hypotony. And this was, um, pressure went down to six, AC shallow, sins and flare, and choroidal effusion. She had the B-scan that showed effusion, and the diagnosis was silly body shut down because she started COSOP drops and it has been reported that COSOP drops or dorsolamide or carbonic anhydrase inhibitors causes some problem during um, in some patients and causes severe hypotony. Um, this has been reported in some of the papers, but it's just um, be careful if you want to go back to fix hypotony after glaucoma surgery, you have to put it in context. Does it have a large bleb or are we just going to fix it anyway? Because you can make a decision, this is an overdraining bleb, you take back the theater and it's already scarred down. So uh, you have to plan your intervention, not just taking the patient back to theater. Again, the last thing is be careful, an indication of uh, revision is not the number of the pressure, is the complication that caused by the low number of the pressure. And uh, I would like to thank um, the panel and everyone for this interesting webinar, and I hope uh, that you all stay safe. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Ahmed, thank you very much. That's really great. Um, um, and then uh, you have a question. Um, uh, why not to inject a heavy helium inside the anterior chamber? Okay. Uh, heavy helium like helium 5 can cause very high pressure. Um, so it can take you to the other extreme. The proof, you need just a little bit pressure higher to support the eye until it sorts itself out during this early period. But if you uh, put the very high um, visco like helon 5, it can stay longer and it can bring the pressure up to 50, then you will have to take out this uh, uh, sutures uh, earlier to relieve this pressure or take the patient back for paracetamol. And having mentioned and having said that, this happened after Zen operation, and they put instead of helon of the pluvisc, just helon 5, and the pressure went up to 50. Patient went back home. It was very difficult to, to go come back to the AE and was operated for TRAB, emergency TRAB, just because of the injection of the heavy uh, helon 5. Mm. Then you have to remove it through the paracentesis or what? Yes. Yes, because if it's very high, you have to keep pressing the paracentesis to relieve it. So um, we have learned, especially again, if there is a stent into the supramid, uh, sorry, supramid or stent into the valve or the barbell tube, you can have this problem as well. So if you have a small stent like the Zen or a barbell tube with a stent, definitely don't put a thick healer. So like Helon 5 or Helon G. Um, I have a, a comment uh, if you um, allow me. Thanks, Dr. Ahmed, for the great presentation. So I remember around August <clears throat> or July of 2018, New World Medical has sent 
a letter that uh, something has changed in the manufacturing of the valve material uh, of the FP7. And thank you so much for actually um, commenting on never touching the box because you can change the valve mechanism. And uh, like I see a lot of videos and like people are handling the, the, the device from that place and it just gives me a heart attack. But thank you for um, you know, raising that issue. However, after that manufacturing like thing has changed, there was a wave of like, you know, across the US and I remember uh, like reading the list serve of the American Glaucoma Society emails, like, you know, tens of emails every day from um, surgeons in the US complaining that, um, you know, they have been getting hypotony with, uh, you know, FP7 amides. Um, I started actually when I put in an FP7, which is not my preferred tube, uh, to uh, use uh, Helon TV, um, a little bit thicker than Helon, I think it's 15 mg per ml rather than the Helon 10 mg per ml. And, um, uh, you know, I think that uh, I have less hypotony with this right now. However, like really most of my hypotenies are with the FP7 rather than the, the uh, like, you know, the, 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 the widespread notion that uh, Barvilles actually give you more hypotony. Um, and the second comment is uh, like, you know, one option for a, um, you know, failed encapsulation after um, the Barville opens is we can stent um, intracamerally the tube with uh, a proline. Um, so for partial obstruction, we can use 4 proline or for complete obstruction, if it's severe or um, hypony with like, you know, consequences, then um, a 2 proline. Yeah, that's all. Okay, can I comment on that? <clears throat> okay, first of all, uh, the Ahmad valve, just because some countries uh, are not that rich to have one valve that it's over draining on table and the AC is shallow. So, okay, through this Ahmed valve, bring me another one. I would advise the surgeon to just tie off the Ahmed valve. I know the company has advice against that, but the one of the good things about tying off the Ahmed valve is you don't have the AC, that field of inflammatory cells that has been draining and have a big capsule at the beginning. Because one of the things against Ahmed valve. It have a high capsule. High capsule can bring more scarring on the long term. So if you have a surgeon that you probably worry about the cost and you have overleaning Ahmed valve on table, please tie it off completely with 8O Vicar or 6O Vicar. And this will open between four and six weeks. And still you can use the, your mito and not worry about the hypotony. As for the proline, I don't want to use the proline rather than the stenting because if you put a proline, then you need to laser later on. It's going to be again all or none. But if you put a stent, you still have a bit of flow and a bit of resistance. So I would rather, if there is hypotony and there is no stent, I would stent first because this gives me a bit of resistance and uh, if I need to take it out later, I will, or not need to take it out later, I will not be back yeah, to uh, square one and hyper. The tube and the AC with the, with the proline. Oh, you mean the proline? Oh, yes, you can. Yeah, so like I showed, yeah. Uh, Super yes. made proline. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I want yeah. to ask the, the, the team. Sure. If you, if you have a patient, uh, he's 35 years old and presenting with advanced glaucoma damage, and the pressure is 40 under full treatment. So what's your operation of a choice? So, uh, doctor, okay. uh, uh, can I answer first? Aye, 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 please. Okay, for any advanced glaucoma and the pressure and the patient is youngster, like 40. So I would look at this patient that he needs very low pressure for the rest of his life, if I can. And the only operation as mentioned by Andrew Scott, that can reach pressure of nine or 10 for long years off drops is probably the trabeculate. And the earlier I do it, and without soaking the eye in drops for long years, the conch is still good and doesn't scar too much and the success of the trabe will be better. That's Interesting, Dr. Ali. 
I think Dr. Dr. Ali, Ali. Uh, Dr. Ali is uh, joining us. I see it's here. Dr. Ali, the, the operation of a choice for a patient, a young patient with a pressure of 40. So what, what's, what would be your operation of a choice? Trap, non-penetrating surgery, valve, or what? I think you're on mute. A child of what age? A, a, a person of 35 years old with a pressure okay. of 40 years for advanced yeah. glaucoma. So yeah. what, what would be your operation of a choice? Okay. So, I mean, due to the younger age of the patient, I would really uh, prefer to keep any um, uh, conjunctival procedure uh, for maybe a later uh, time in life. I would, um, I would probably at that point uh, go for a GAT, uh, uh, an angle uh, surgery, and, and uh, uh, that would give me an option later on to add uh, more uh, procedures. I would try to preserve the conjunctiva for later on in life. GAT would be um, effective in, in a case like that. It would bring the pressure uh, down. Um, and at the same time, uh, I would still have my options open for further interventions. Interesting. Um, I would stay away from trabeculectomies because of the younger age of the patient and the potential um, uh, problems that I can get into um, uh, in terms of, of bleb uh, uh, integrity. I would uh, stay away from a tube uh, if I can afford to uh, because the risks of uh, some kind of endothelial decompensation or... Uh, or, uh, or cell loss, endothelial cell loss, uh, would be at that point an issue to, 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 to consider. Interesting. Shamira? Uh, I must say, I'm of the opinion that the TRAB will do better in the long term, and I just have to take the risk that, you know, this is going to cause some cataract in a young patient, unfortunately, but if you really want those l l low pressures down to that level for a long period, TRAB's the only one that has got proven success. Interesting. Mohammed? Um, so I would uh, definitely go for a tube, and um, the reason being, uh, uh, no, we actually should not do a GAT uh, because it's only a temporary measure, in my opinion. And I do GATs mainly in the two extremes of age, so for the very young or like or like the young juvenile, and the old that I you know doesn't have a long life expectancy and like you know would do okay with just a gap maybe like you know buy him a year or two uh, but uh, for like somebody who's young in their 30s uh, I would intervene and do a real surgery earlier than later sooner than later and um, I would try to avoid Crabs, because I don't want to expose them to the lifelong risk of endophthalmitis with mitomycin C and all that. So, interesting. Uh, interesting. Yes. Andrew, do you have uh, do you want to add I something? Would, yeah. I would certainly do a trap in this case. Okay, uh, it is the operation, as I said, that will 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 have the lowest pressure, which is what you want. What you want in an patient like this, a pressure of ten or even lower and for the longest period of time. And you wouldn't want to do anything that's gonna compromise a subsequent trab in the future. So if you do a, if you do a tube, you know, uh, there is, you, you do, there, and the tube is not enough to reduce pressure, there's no way you can later on go and do a trab because the trab is not gonna work. Whereas if you do a trab, and hopefully you're buying as long time as possible, and later on, as when he's 50, 60, and he might need further pressure lowering after lots of drops, etc. You can then move on to a tube, etc. So definitely a trap. Interesting. And for myself, I'll go for non-penetrating surgery with anti-metabolite. I might be one of the modifications that I have mentioned. Now, I see Dr. Ali is just uh, expecting the first patient to come in to the clinic. <laughs> so that was, yes. <laughs> So uh, that that was great, really. I want I want to thank you all for uh, accepting this invitation. Thank you very much. And, and I know the timing is not appropriate and suitable for most of you. So that I thank you very very much, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been very. Thank successful. you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Yeah, let's communicate. Yes. Thanks bye everyone. bye. Good to see uh, you. Thank you. See you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank bye. You. bye.